let's go ahead and uh, call this uh, special board meeting to order. It's 502 on July 7th, 2020. And we have a whole lot of updates here on our return to learn plan. Um, so I will go ahead and pass it off to Matt to get us going. Thanks, Sean. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you all. Um, as we promised, we would come back here weekly in July with some additional information uh, to try to continue to update you on our progress and share more detail around our uh, return to learn plans. Um, one thing I do want to make sure we allot some time for is I know Brady has a piece this evening around uh, some feedback he's received from the association around some of the different models uh, we shared last week too. So I don't want to lose track of that. We'll work through kind of uh, some of the introductory parts here, uh, but then at the end, Brady, if I don't cue you in, don't be afraid, I guess, to, to speak up and jump in. So uh, we make sure, because I know people are interested to hear that as well. So uh, we thank him for going that extra leg and, and getting some additional feedback from staff uh, for us to share that component. Um, the other couple of contextual things I'd say before we uh, kind of dive into the attachment that's uploaded there for you is that uh, we've kind of loosely been sharing that um, we'll need a, a decision about how we would anticipate starting school in the fall um, about a month in advance of when school actually starts. And so, uh, believe it or not, that kind of puts us looking at, at next week in, in some ways uh, before we start welcoming staff back. And so, um, I think what I would ask you to do is to look at this with a, a keen eye on what else you need to know from us uh, before we have that conversation next week around uh, where our preferred um, starting approach would be as we enter the school year. And so if there's additional details or information uh, that you're not seeing or that would be helpful to provide uh, to be able to make that decision, I think we would want to um, obviously know that and be able to come back uh, prepared to answer some of those, those questions uh, to the best of our ability. Um, and so I would just ask everybody to click into that uh, attachment that we have there as we work our way um, through the conversation tonight. That'll really uh, provide a lot of our information, detail, and even a couple liftoff points to look at some additional uh, documents as we go through there. Can we so get on that on the screen, Matt, for anybody watching or no? Yeah, I can share it here. Can everybody see that? Yeah, right. looks good. I'm gonna try to move my Zoom window around here so I can read what's in front of me. So the one thing um, that as we, as we start this uh, conversation, um, we wanted to uh, try to clarify our commitment before I get into the specific models conversation. I think it's important to consider these factors that were at the front end of our thinking as we went uh, through our planning efforts uh, in any of the models and any of the decisions and, and points we tried to consider. Uh, and so first of all, health and safety, the health and safety of our students and staff has been and will continue to be a top priority in the return to learn decision-making uh, plans reflect guidance and consultation from the CDC, the Iowa Department of Public Health and Johnson County Public Health. And, and I think we've tried to be and will continue to be transparent and honest that uh, health and safety is, is a primary uh, focus for us, but that in some situations or in some models, it's, it's not risk-free and it's, it's not uh, problem-free um, and we're not able to do everything that we'd like to to, to that extent in all of the models. Uh, academic focus, um, I remember con uh, a conversation Sean had with us a few weeks ago around the focus on learn, that it's return to learn plan and that um, academics have to be a major priority of this. And so that's definitely been a focus for us and even trying to learn from our experience in the spring. Um, and so we, um, they, we believe those return to learn plans reflect a goal to conduct traditional classroom learning with some mitigation efforts and strategies in place to allow for the safest possible reopening of schools and the instructional models um, that have those at home, um, include those at home learning options in the event that traditional classroom learning cannot occur. And, and we know that we would like to get uh, kids back in school and that we would like them learning at school, um, but it, it's impossible to think about that without uh, thinking about the health and safety components and how that affects that. The equity uh, component is, is obviously huge for us. Um, last time we talked about a universal design for equity 
and how it's in the front end of our planning uh, process throughout and embedded into each of the conversations we've had around the different areas. And so um, we wanted to continue that focus on a universal design for equity while also trying to uh, give special attention to our structurally disadvantaged students and uh, students that um, oftentimes um, do not have a successful experience in our system uh, so that we don't further disadvantage them through this process. And then finally, flexibility and parent choice. Um, we know that uh, there has to be a great deal of flexibility built into our return to learn plans uh, for families, uh, staff, and uh, you know, so that um, everybody's situation is different and has to be accounted for and people need to be able to make the best choices uh, for themselves um, to the greatest extent possible. And so uh, we believe we've tried to allow for a fluid response uh, to the ever fluid nature of the COVID uh, pandemic. And we understand that each family situation is um, different, like I said, and that uh, an element of choice is um, necessary to ensure continued health, safety, and comfort of our families uh, when returning to, to school. So as we talk about um, the different um, model components we have here, as, you, as you're going to see on all the slides, we talk about an on-site learning model, an off-site learning model, and then a hybrid learning model. And as we started this conversation with you, it was easy to think about those three as separate. And I think what we've learned as we went through these processes is it's really a continuum and that in any model, uh, we're really almost in a hybrid scenario. And that was kind of the point I think we tried to draw towards the end of the last meeting that even if we're on an on-site model, that element of choice um, kind of automatically puts us in somewhat of a hybrid. Um, in an off-site model, you know, there could be an element that looks hybridish too that uh, we, we would have some selected students on, on site. And then, and of course, a overall hybrid model, um, that one's self-explanatory that we're doing a little bit of both. And so um, the first part I'm gonna take here before I turn it in over to Amy on some of the academic instruction side is the element of parent choice in each of those uh, three models. In the on-site model, um, you can see that is more of a traditional model with health and safety uh, considerations implemented. And so parents there would have the opportunity to opt students out of on-site learning and follow the off-site continuous online learning model. And so they would essentially do choose learning at home and uh, they would be able to participate and, and continue their child's education in that fashion rather than sending them uh, to school on a, on a consistent basis. In the off-site model, uh, that's uh, really the frame of reference here is the required continuous online learning with the consideration of bringing a limited number of students on site. And so here we talk about based on termination of the district, there could be limited opportunities for in-person services. And here we talk about it being restricted to zero to 25% of the student population. So uh, this allows for some space that if the situation doesn't allow us for to do, um, if it's too severe and there, we don't even feel like our health and safety uh, mitigation efforts, uh, would be sufficient to bring kids on campus. Um, that would be obviously where we'd end up in the zero. If we think we could do some things to ensure health and safety based on uh, the level of um, COVID cases or community spread, uh, then we could uh, look towards bringing that number up higher and bringing additional students on campus for some limited um, in-person services to them. And then finally, the hybrid <clears throat> that generated a lot of our conversation uh, last week talks about um, really those, those two different approaches that we could look at uh, straight PK-12 on AB days or a PK-4 on-site daily with a 5-12 split uh, between the AB and there the parents would still be allowed to have the opportunity to opt students out of on-site learning and follow that continuous learning. So they'd still have an element of choice there too uh, to, um, if they didn't feel like even every other day uh, was a good solution for their family that they could still participate in at-home learning and we'd provide that service. So that's a brief overview of the kind of the different models and the, the parent choice component. And as we work through here, you can see this, the structure that we're going to try to provide as we walk through each of the considerations uh, through those three different uh, what we see as options for, for how we would look at the school year or to start. So Amy, if you wanted to go ahead and jump into academic instruction, I think we're ready for that. Sure, so good evening everyone. Um, it's great to be back with you to talk about the plans as they continue to crystallize and we're excited to bring the product that we have in front of you here uh, tonight. Um, as you can see the document, um, there's 14 different areas we decided to highlight this evening. And 
we were purposeful in how we uh, constructed the document. And so the first five areas really can be delineated out by how they could differ um, depending on the model that you're in. And then you see towards the latter half of the document that the remaining nine areas then um, pretty much no matter what model we're in, we, those items would be consistent. So I'm gonna take the first few topics here and then transition over to Chase. But as far as academic instruction, again, thinking about the parents' ability to have some choice, our on-site classes would follow the traditional school schedule at both the secondary and elementary levels. Um, there would be some adjustments for instruction uh, to help limit student contact. Think, you know, uh, suggestions for uh, not utilizing the group project approach, small group instruction uh, maybe has to look a little bit different, um, and then limiting the use of shared materials. But by and large, the academic day would follow, you know, what we've all grown accustomed to, or certainly, you know, what we left school um, in, in the month of March. And then if you uh, click on and move over to the offsite schedules, this um, somewhat would resemble what we experienced last year during school closure. Although last spring, uh, the DE certainly allowed districts to take the choice whether to um, uh, be involved in voluntary enrichment opportunities or to require the learning. We would move to required learning um, for PK through 12 students. And what we've linked in there today is um, three different schedules for remote learning. Uh, one for PK students, one for elementary students, and then one for secondary students. And in there, we tried to make some notes. Um, you know, the, the entire um, program isn't based on synchronous learning. So there's definitely times during this uh, student day that there's synchronous learning opportunities, um, but there's definitely time built in there for asynchronous opportunities. There's a lot of other schedules that are behind these that are specific to teacher expectations um, and they're built out by grade level, but this should give you a, a decent overview of um, you know, what team this particular team has, has been working on. Um, there's been lots of consideration given to understanding what best practices would say around appropriate screen time, uh, depending on the grade level of the students. And of course, as Matt already mentioned, there might be a limited uh, number of students who would be brought on site then to, um, to fall in line still with what was being offered in the way of that online schedule, but with um, some supports you know, around the students in that situation, as well as some opportunity to receive those direct services. So think of possible um, specially designed instruction for our students, our special education students. Um, and uh, perhaps our English language learner students would receive uh, their uh, loud plan minutes that they um, are prescribed for the week. And then the hybrid model. And so as we think about what the academic day might look like, um, depending on what model that we're in, if you, if you would take the um, PK4 and 512 AB rotation idea first, our PK4 students would experience very much the typical day as we described over there in the on-site um, model. There'd be some adjustments to limit student contact there. And, um, and if you were thinking about then um, our 512 students, they'd receive the face-to-face -face instruction every other day. And the teacher then um, would prescribe what needs to happen in the way of asynchronous learning activities during that off-site day. So they might be going back into um, their Canvas or their Seesaw to um, still watch a video, but it would be asynchronous at that time. The teacher wouldn't necessarily be with the student because they would be teaching the next um, group of students that are there. So I don't know if we should pause, Matt, how you want to take this or if we want to take questions at the, the end. Yeah, I would just say, do you guys um, want to spend some more time in these uh, schedules? Um, would you like Amy or Diane to walk you through uh, some of the specific components of those schedules? I know you haven't seen those before and there's a lot there. So I know Diane would be happy to give an overview of those if that would be helpful for the continuous online learning. You could tell it's quite robust compared to what you would have uh, seen from us in the spring. So um, we can take, yeah, we can take questions here or uh, we can give an overview of those schedules. Sean, any preference on where you'd like us uh, to? I guess if there's any specific questions on the schedules, because I, I did, I was kind of concerned with um, how it worked, you know, if we're doing a, 
say an AB, right? But then some students and families have opted out of it and they're doing some online learning. Is, is that then completely separated from this part, right? Because uh, it's not the same thing as the off day stuff. Right, that's a great doing. question and a good distinction to make and, and one I meant to try to say from the outset. And so if families opt into that at home learning experience, uh, we would envision a, a period of time where they would select that option and then that would be separate, uh, kind of a, a separate academy uh, type sense. I, I don't necessarily like the word academy, but a different uh, group of students that would be engaged in that at home learning aligned with some of our staff members delivering that service, which is completely different than the students that would be going through the, the AB rotation in that model. And so you could kind of think about those running parallel to each other uh, in that sense. And then my, my other question was around uh, specifically elementary and the specials, and I saw that it was in there, right, for the, mm -hmm. the full day stuff. I don't, I don't know exactly how that plays out in uh, every other day thing and how that happens or if they're all happening or if they're happening in different ways or whatnot. Sure. Well, um, we'll get into some of the other considerations around health and safety because that um, – affects some of that conversation, John, but you would think about uh, students really uh, somewhat running through a traditional day. Some of the health and safety mitigation efforts we put it could put in or would put in would change uh, some of how that might look or how it gets delivered. Um, but as far as the schedule goes, um, majority of that would look the same as a traditional day. They would just be on site every other day um, in that sense, if that is helping. Um, That's the elementary question. one. Maybe I'll go down to the secondary one. Sorry, Lisa, did you have something there? Didn't mean yes, to I, I had a couple of questions um, about the elementary schedule. Uh, so looking at the day until lunch with all the blocks, is that, do we envision that those blocks actually having a teacher on the other side of the screen leading the students through each of those blocks of instruction? Sure. I'm going to let Diane talk next. Yeah, I was going to say, Diane, sure. if you don't want to jump in here and kind of talk that through about how that would work and, and some of the components of that, that's a good question, Lisa. Yep. There are some notes underneath that schedule for um, other people who might want to look at that too. But if we just kind of follow a kindergarten day, um, their class meeting that starts at the beginning, that would be synchronous. So that would be a teacher and the whole class coming together. Then when they would go to the core language arts, that could be um, primarily video based. So it would be a video that the teachers have developed, but that wouldn't necessarily have to be watched at that time. We were really trying to be conscious of the times when parents had to log on and then the times when there might be some flexibility. So we tried to give flexibility there. During the small group reading blocks, we envision that as being maybe a 20 minute, 15, 20 minute period where some kids would get on in this small group and then the other kids could be working on asynchronous activities. And then the teacher would just every 15 or 20 minutes rotate who she or he was working with at that time. So there would be maybe 20 minutes of synchronous per child in that, but the teacher would be engaged the whole time. And then the core math and small group math kind of follow that same pattern. So core math being video based and then the small group math being that time when the teacher could work with smaller groups of kids throughout that time. And then the specials, that would be another time when the whole class would get together. So that would be another synchronous learning time. And then after lunch, now we have some flexibility in the day as well that if students needed interventions, then the teacher could pull individually or small groups of kids again back together for additional intervention time. And then when we're talking about asynchronous learning opportunities for our elementary age kids and um, or, or video opportunities, what is the vision of the adult supervision necessary at home to, and, and obviously that's going to look different for a kindergartner than a sixth grader, but I think it's important for, for the community and parents to understand their expectation um, under this model. Right. We've talked a lot about, um, you know, teachers' desires to, to help parents through that process. Like our, our envision, we would love to at least get kids in for a few weeks so we can even help them learn how to independently do some of this, how to independently log on to Alexia or Dreambox, how to get to their Seesaw class, 
how to even independently get onto a Zoom. But we know, and as you said, for those young kids, there probably is going to need to be some parent um, supervision and parent support with some of these activities, certainly. As the kids get older, they can be more independent. Diane, it's Janet, I have a question about the video um, components on the core um, sections. Do those videos exist or are teachers kind of in the process of building out those those videos? I mean, I can imagine a teacher doing instruction on a smart board or something and videoing it and, and then using that in one of those core sections. I just didn't know that material had already been developed. Some has. So Super Kids, the, the new reading curriculum that we're using in K2, they started developing those videos during the closure last spring and they are committed to providing those videos all throughout next year. So that's kind of a win for us. Um, some of the others, the, the wonders and the envision, there are some video components that are just part of teacher lessons that we'll use, but our plan would be to pay um, some teachers to develop these videos. So instead of having 55 second grade teachers having developed a language arts video, we're gonna get a core group of teachers that are working with our language arts um, elementary specialist to develop really high quality videos that then all the language arts teachers can kind of push out to their kids and then support during that small group reading time. That's great, thank you. Hey Diane, just to follow up on that, uh, the Super Kids question, that's the, the company Super Kids has already made the videos, right? Not our district employees. Yes. Are made. Yep. Um, to follow up on Janet's question about the videos, do we anticipate using the same videos for the parents? I, I know that Matt said to think of these as parallel tracks, but will there be some commonality of curriculum for the opt-in totally online parents and then, and then this model? Yeah, yes. So we would see some, a lot of parallel, parallels between this model here, if you're talking about required continuous learning, between this model and then the one that parents would opt into. Yeah, the difference would be the AB model versus the one parents would opt into. Then there wouldn't be as much um, maybe similarities, but this one would be very close to what the parents would opt into. Hi, how would this model work with students that have an IEP and maybe somebody that has a para? I'm, I'm just not understanding how they would be able to um, continue to receive the same educational services if they were on site. Lisa, do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about remote learning plans uh, for the special education students? That would, I think, help address uh, Ruthina's question. Yes, I want to, um, I could, I had a hard time hearing Ruthina, but I think what, what you asked Ruthina was that, how would this work for students with IEPs? Um, and how would they be able to uh, receive appropriate instruction as they were on site? Um, basically, so every student with an IEP will have a remote learning plan um, made for them by their team. Um, and that just means that their IEP team will get together and, and take a look at how will their, what will their instruction, how will their instruction look um, under a hybrid model and then under a um, continuous learning model and taking the schedule into account, um, you know, what, what does it look like for everyone else? And then, so how does their instruction need to look? And, um, you know, figuring out what, how will that instruction actually, um, what will the, the goal work look like? What are priorities for the goal? Um, work now that, uh, you know, considering the model that we'll be under. Um, and actually the remote learning plan will can um, include uh, provisions for both the continuous learning and the hybrid model. Um, so that as we kind of toggle, if we need to toggle back and forth between those models, the, that would, uh, we'll just be able to employ provisions for both um, immediately so that we won't have to get the team together every single time we change models if, if needed. Um, and the team will have some guiding questions behind um, helping the team navigate through. And those are the tools that our Return to Learn Committee is coming up with right now. Um, and so the team will have some guidance in how to, how to do that. Um, so we start with what everyone else, you know, what, what does it look like for everyone else? And, um, you know, so just, just, like, just like when we're at school, 
um, we start with, you know, what, what, what's supplied to everyone else and then how do we robust that up for um, the individual that we're talking about now. All right, Amy, maybe you want to go, go on to the child care component. Yeah. yeah, so when we think about child care, we're um, both thinking about you know, our families and our staff. And so when we're in the on-site on -site model, this you know, potentially has the least impact on child care for families and staff. We revert back to um, our previous practices, whether it's uh, families finding, you know, and staff finding their own daycare or our before and after school been running and you know that has to be done in um, in conjunction with DHS guidelines and and making sure that um, we're following that and you know uh, that the BASPs are also um, getting the enrollment that they need to to open and be vi be viable um, when you think about the off-site model then this model of course has the biggest impact on child care for families and staff potentially um, given that, uh, you know, of course, our staff is still required to work and we, we've heard from a lot of people, teachers, administrators, paras, support staff that, um, you know, are trying to engage their children in learning all the while working. So we know that this is a difficult piece for everyone. Um, before and after school programs may run again with capacity determined in conjunction with DHS guidelines and you see that language there run across all three models that last that last bullet. Um, and then, of course, depending on what which AB model um, that we're in, it has some impact on childcare for families and staff. If, if we do bring the PK4 um, children on site every day, of course, that's helping take care of that component um, for our families and for our staff. Um, and then again, the mention of before and after school program programming. So what questions does that um, bring forward or, or maybe don't have any? So, uh, uh, Amy, this is Charlie. Uh, uh, all the options for BASP uh, continuation are uh, 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 contingent. Do you have any idea as yet when we can say that each a, pr a program in a school is going to continue or not? Yeah, so you, you see right now, Charlie, that we um, have offered it out to try to stand up as many programs as we could. and. You know, the timing of it, I think it was probably difficult for a lot of our programs, but even though we had interest in June from about five or six providers, we're, you know, only able to stand up in a, in a couple of buildings. But I would say, you know, we, we know that child care is a key ingredient and a key piece. I think the one piece that we want to reserve some judgment on is if we had to have 100% of our um, students and staff in continuous learning and there would be a reason for that. And, and then we'd wanna think real carefully still about uh, standing up a BASP program. Um, not to say that we wouldn't do it, but I think that that's the, the one um, circumstance that we would find ourselves in. That, but in the remaining uh, models that are described here, I think that we would attempt to do it on, in all three. But you know, we'd have to work closely with uh, DHS. Right now, our model is um, no more than 10, um, people in a group. And so that could consist of two staff members and eight students, or, you know, one staff member is the model that we're employing right now. All right, let's transition then to class sizes. So in our, in our on-site model, our class sizes would represent our typical allocations. And as a board, you just uh, approved this new superintendent directions 3J6, which has a special al allocation for kindergarten now. And I linked that in there. Um, and then the elementary RAM that follows that, I, I linked that in there as well. That document was shared with you at the first board meeting in June. Um, some, I just put the caveat in there that of course, some secondary class sizes are larger than the aspirational goals seen in those superintendent directions, which, which has been par for the course, but we want to be transparent that in this model, you know, that's, that's the class sizes that have to exist. Um, some reductions possibly could be seen um, overall though in class sizes because we might see a lot of families or some families at least opt into this choice aspect with uh, the continuous online learning model. 
Um, social distancing of desks is really not feasible under this model given some of the class sizes that you see there. In the offsite model, where we've talked about um, the possibility of having anywhere from 0% to up to 25% of our student population back with us, of course, um, those class sizes would be considerably smaller um, and minimal due to, to the number of students that we're possibly bringing back in any, any of those scenarios. And then our hybrid, this is one that I'm going to take a little bit, try to spend a little bit of time with, um, just to share some different things that we've tried to do with the numbers to see how much movement we might be able to get. And so when we think about the PK4 um, model where we'd have kiddos on campus every day and the, eight, the 512 kiddos would be rotating, our elementary class sizes could be altered as such that, um, I'm gonna just jump over the fifth and sixth grade for example. So if you think about the superintendent directions, our class sizes, you really see our buildings falling out at the fifth and sixth grade level with class sizes of, you know, up uh, aspirational goals of no more than 26, 28, 30, 32. And so those are, those are still fairly large. But if we're not bringing fifth and sixth graders to campus every day, we could theoretically take all the fifth and sixth grade class sizes where it worked out and cap them all at the same at no more than 32. If we did that then, we know that during the rotation, a classroom teacher would have you know, approximately no more than 16 students. So if we did that and we applied it to our existing enrollment, um, what we found is that we could take the remaining FTE then that was left. And if we divided that equally across our buildings and across the K, uh, kindergarten through fourth grades, that um, we could um, have class sizes, uh, I'm going to say approximately with a cap of 26. And so all of this is with the caveat that, you know, we're using our best guess or projections from the end of March. And so, of course, depending on what the enrollment actually shapes up to look like, this all could uh, change a little bit. But let's just take the, let's just go on this bird walk and think that we took fifth and sixth grade up to 32. Really, the teachers were seeing, you know, a maximum of 16 students. Um, that number I used because that has been the top of our aspirational class sizes in RAM level five before. Um, the difficulty with this is um, that, you know, some of our buildings, depending on where you've um, been located in the RAM before, their class sizes in first and second grade have been around 20 or 22 or 24 in the past. And so to see that everybody's kind of sharing um, the, the same, uh, we're flattening the RAM essentially and saying, to do that with the remaining FTE, some classes would still have to go up to 26. Now that doesn't mean every grade level and every building is gonna sit that high. Some still are gonna have a cohort of 16 and some are gonna have the 26, but it's what we could get to with the remaining FTE. Um, so th that's one thing to think about. Um, if you think about the AB pre-K through 12 model, everybody's rotating every other day, we would suggest um, just you know, employing our current superintendent directions. And, um, you know, again, we would have at the elementary level, class size is no larger than 16, given that we can go up to 32 in some situation. Um, of course, our goal would be to provide social distancing with desks based on um, the World Health Organization's recommendation of three feet. Um, but as we've been out, looked at square footages in our classrooms and in our average classrooms, we know that this um, guarantee is, is not um, there for every classroom. Um, I think, I hope it's okay for me to share this, but just in some of the, the classrooms that we have gone out to, to look at it, we're thinking that to, to ensure that on average, now of course all of our class sizes aren't, um, or all of our square footage in our classrooms are not built the same way, but you know, that's, you you're might be looking closer to about 20 desks. So we just wanted to be real clear that, um, you know, we can't guarantee, guarantee that social distancing aspect there. So with that, I would take questions. I think Amy did a nice job explaining that first one. And I think the, you know, the key question is there, it goes against a, you know, a fundamental value and belief we've had around how we've allocated staffing with the RAM at the expense of trying to create some opportunities for um, manageable class sizes for all to be able to do some element of distancing in the room. And so flattening the RAM um, is not how we've made decisions about allocating staff in the past. 
the trade-off here is to to try to equalize you know it, it's not equitable it would be equalizing uh, some of the the class sizes across the district and so um, we felt that was at least a, a suggestion or a solution we needed to try to provide uh, for your thinking um, as we look throughout uh, through that that modeling part there but like Amy said if you guys have questions on this one we'd be happy to take them here too. Yeah. One more thing that I didn't outline, and I think maybe the board, maybe you all understand this, but I, I want to just highlight it. So if we didn't do that with the kindergarten through fourth grade class sizes, remember that for our third and fourth graders, based on the superintendent directions, particularly if you're in schools like RAM level four, or RAM level five schools, remember your class sizes can go up to 30 or 32. So you would have your class sizes at 32 where your fifth and sixth grade counterparts, their kiddos are you know, um, coming in at, at 16. And so that's another reason, just wanna make sure we're pointing out that 26 doesn't sound great, but it's still, not, it's still better than the 30 or 32 or even the 28 that you know, some, some class sizes would be sitting at. I'm gonna jump in with the a comment and then I do have a question. Um, so my comment is more of a housekeeping thing and I think this is more for you know everybody that's a panelist on this call. Um, I, it was pointed out to me that you know in, in normal board meeting fashion if we were all sitting together in a boardroom um, we would not be uh, answering questions live from folks and I think we need to kind of try and maintain that so as questions come in um, and everybody listening, feel free to ask your questions, but I think we'll have to kind of take those and try and figure out if we get to those answers either in this meeting or future meetings, um, but also, you know, kind of take them in as part of the conversation and not answer them live as part of the chat. I think we want to try and maintain some of what we would do in a normal board meeting in that fashion. So now my question on the staffing um, I know this is specifically around class sizes and stuff, and I tried to look to see if we got to it later and we didn't quite hit, hit it. So I'm gonna ask it now. Um, what does either the A, B model, well, any of the models really do with any of the other staffing? You know, how would paras be assigned? Or if only half the kids are eating, does that change how we're doing nutritional staffing? Are they coming in different times? I know they're probably doing multiple meals in one day, so they're probably doing twice as much work anyway. And um, you know, facilities folks and things like that. How, how does that impact all of that staffing, not just teachers? Yeah, you're gonna notice that um, staffing uh, is not on the document uh, this week. And so there's a, there's a lot of good questions you asked in there, Sean, that um, we plan to come back with uh, in next week's piece. Uh, but some of those things I would just say in general, when you think about an AB, you know, we would have staff on site every day and um, with having half the students there and a, and a full staff, um, potentially that would allow us to do some, some additional uh, health and safety mitigation efforts as well uh, through that AB model that you wouldn't have the opportunity to do with, if, with all those staff serving all those students uh, or with uh, all of the students on campus at once. And so we will provide a, a, some additional staffing conversation points in the weeks forward, but I think that's a good one to think about from a frame of reference that if you really have your um, if you have a good bulk of your staff there on a, on a daily basis and half the students, the, the things that would allow you to do would obviously be increased. Thanks, I appreciate that. Anybody else have questions they wanna ask on the class size stuff? I'm just making a list of questions as I go combined with the ones that I had before this. So I'm just gonna ask them all at the end if that's all right. You bet, Paul. Thank you. All right, transportation. Chase, I think this is where. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Nice to be with you virtually so we can talk a little bit more of our uh, return to learn planning. And um, just a quick pause to say a big thank you to um, all of our teams that have been working. I know that Amy, Matt, and I are, are doing the, the vast majority of the talking tonight, but uh, a lot of work has gone into this, as you all know, from a number of people and I, I don't want to uh, forget to give a shout out to those folks that are also um, on the panel with us that have provided a lot of keen insight and in doing a lot of the, the hard work behind this and um, speaking of hard work transportation is one of those areas where um, there are no easy solutions as we look at what we want to do 
in our return to learn plan as we look at coming back um, in a more traditional setting with uh, the, majority, the vast majority of our students um, on campus and our on-site model. Um, we'd be forced to go with um, our basically our typical bus routes and, and fill our our buses to capacity as they as they currently are. We would uh, we would have all riders and the drivers wear face coverings. We would assign seating, and the uh, bus company uh, would perform uh, daily cleaning of the buses both um, in the evening and then at the midday. But uh, we would not be able to provide uh, very much social distancing on the buses at all. Um, like our teachers, uh, and we like, like working with Brady and our teachers on some of their um, health concerns and, and other ideas and thoughts they have as we look at Return to Learn. We're also working with our bus company to set up a time to have that same sort of conversation with the drivers about what their concerns are, what their suggestions are of how we can run our buses in the safest and uh, most, uh, most healthy way possible. We met with the bus company last week and the bus company and myself are trying to find a time that we can set a meeting up with the drivers here in the next couple weeks to continue this conversation as we move down this path. As we look at the offsite model, obviously with zero to 25% of our students potentially on campus, that's a, um, a much lower number of, of students that might be riding the bus. The 28 uh, student number comes from the CDC guidelines, although we've also seen information and it's continued to evolve, to evolve come from the Department of Education that if uh, students do wear um, face coverings that we can exceed that number. And so um, using uh, PPE in the form of a face covering, they say does help um, provide some additional protection um, for students and for the driver. And we know in that offsite model that we, we could manage keeping it with that CDC recommendation of 28 students uh, per bus. If we look at the hybrid model, um, we start with 28 students per bus um, with that caveat of when feasible, and, and that's really um, important. We don't wanna mislead anyone here. I think our goal would be to get to that 28 students, um, but that would really be dependent on um, which model we selected, whether that was K-12 AB, um, and then if there were students and families that chose to stay at home anyway, because we don't have the buses um, to add enough additional routes um, to ensure that every bus rider, even in an AB model, would be on a bus that only had 28 students. And if we look at a K-4 or pre-K-4 model where students are on campus every day, we, we already know that it would not be feasible to provide uh, transportation for 28 students or less per bus in that model. And so it would look more like our current model where we would um, have students um, on our bus in numbers that are more typical of what we have right now. Again, we would um, have face coverings for students and for the driver. We would assign seating. Um, while that might seem like a small, uh, small item, it does ensure that the contact is limited to the same individuals that are on the bus and sit around students on a daily basis. And then we would have those cleaning and sanit sanitization practices done by the drivers and the bus company um, on a daily basis as well. That's a brief overview of transportation and where we are as you look at the three models. Are there questions that I can answer on the transportation piece at this point? Um, hey Chase, I have a question. Um, are you considering sending out any type of survey um, once we just land on a plan, sending out a survey to parents who um, may want to opt out of busing transportation but and take responsibility for driving their kids to school just so that we get better accurate numbers of who will actually be on the bus? Yes, that's a great, that's a great question, Lisa, most specifically for transportation. I think it also speaks to some broader issues where there are some of those things that we need to um, really zero in and get um, more concrete information from both our parents and students and also from our staff. And so once we get to a point where we know what model we're gonna start the school year with, we're going to do exactly that. Send a survey to our families to ask some of these critical questions, transportation being one of them. And then also to our staff. Uh, Matt talked a little bit about staffing kind of in a general sense um, just a little bit ago, but to see where they are on some of those pieces as well. Um, 
we know that information is key to families and employees making good decisions. And so we want to be able to provide them um, the most accurate and detailed information to make those decisions from. And so that survey won't come out tomorrow, but as we get closer to that decision point, then we will send that out. And then for contract, contract tracing purposes for bus riders, are we considering a scan on system where we know what students were on the bus every day, maybe the bus driver codes, or we're, we're just gonna leave that up to parents to know when their kid was on the bus and when they weren't? That's a good, um, I've not had an in-depth conversation on that. Kate, has that come up in the, in the Health and Safety Committee? No, it hasn't come up, but we would be able to tell who was on the bus by attendance, most likely. That would be one way to cross-reference. Well, Lisa, that's a, we can bring that also up with um, mm -hmm. the bus company of, of maybe additional protocols we need to put in place to make sure we know exactly what students were on the bus in the mornings and the afternoons for the reasons you just mentioned. Well, and it, it pairs with the guidelines for transitioning to continuous online learning for COVID exposure. I know that there's a bus section there. Um, and I just, the, I think the more that we can be precise about who was physically on a bus and potentially exposed and where they were seating since we have the assigned seating, if based on how that plan works now, I, I think the more information we can have about that, the, the, that'll help us implement that portion of the plan. Absolutely. I would throw this out there. I don't know how big of an impact it would be, but in order to try and, you know, get a few more kids on a bus, but still have the spacing, I assume with the sign seating, you would be able to have two kids or three kids from the same family sitting a lot closer together than kids from other families to try and maximize your space there. Yes, correct. And I guess this is a bus, but it may be somebody else's. Are we changing the bell schedule under any of the models or can, or can parents depend on, we know what time school will start. We may not know who's going, but we know what time a school is starting and we know what time school is ending. Yeah, I would say, um, Lisa, yeah, there's no intent to change the um, start time or the end time of school in um in those models i mean we walked through the continuous learning schedule with you of course that looks a little bit different but in the ab or in the uh on-site model the start and end times aren't different um i i would say we probably still have some work to do around uh what maybe in between that time looks like um as far as uh, how we deliver on on some of those services you know particularly lunch is an example that drops out if we need to modify um some kind of a lunch schedule or a lunch rotation um, those things may not look exactly the same, but I would say start and end times um, will be con will be consistent in that fashion. But but some of the pieces in the middle of the day could could adjust to maybe what pe people typically see. So uh, and along and along with that, with the bell times, and it's a good reminder for us. I think one of the things we talked about last week was, or a couple weeks ago, about the the calendar decision that we were not going to change our calendar either when the school year started or when it ended. And so I think that's in that same uh, vein, Lisa. And so it's a good reminder for us as we do this to present information. We need to make sure that we are tying it back to some of the other things so we don't lose it as we as we evolve and, and narrow the conversation. And so we can make sure that we we note that. Um, we just entitled this uh, section additional social distancing and health and safety measures and really maybe it's general social distancing and health and safety measures um, that, that aren't captured in, in either area, other areas. When we met with the teachers last week, I told them that um, there were about 36 different categories or decision points, some big, some small, but the health and safety team. Um, was still working through and, and, and trying to come up with recommendations for them. So while this list um, is growing and we continue to add specifics around it, uh, by no means uh, do we want the board or the community to walk away tonight thinking this is our exhaustive list of what we're going to do in terms of social distancing and health and safety measures. It's just, as the document says, where we are on July 7th um, of 2020. And so uh, to run, I, I won't read it word for word, but you'll see some of these things talk about um, how classrooms will be configured, uh, removing non-essential furniture, 
um, placing deaths in rows facing the same direction. Amy talked about following the World Health Organization standards of how those would be spaced when, when feasible. Assigned seating at all levels. Um, again, contact tracing. It's important when we look at that transition document uh, that we know where students are seating, especially in grades um, seven through, through 12. Generally moving outside the classroom, we're also looking at ways that we can limit contact in the building. One, P, uh, one safety measure we've already started installing are plexiglass contact barriers in our main offices um, for when folks come to the main office for a variety of reasons that um, the health, excuse me, the office staff is, is not um, exposed any more than, than necessary. We're considering are there other places in the buildings that we might need to have similar barriers. Um, cafeteria is an example of an area that we're considering a library potentially. Um, and there are pros and cons on, on that. And so the health uh, and safety committee is still working um, through some of those pieces. A focus on hand hygiene and, san uh, and um, um, sanitizer and respiratory equity, um, um, etiquette. The CDC, one of their, um, one of their primary um, recommendations about how to slow or stop the spread of COVID is hand washing. And so we want to make sure that, that we're not overlooking some of those things that we can teach our students to do or reinforce with our students and our staff to do. Look at ways to ensure uh, proper ventilation of the buildings. Um, look at traffic flow patterns with, within the buildings. And then, of course, try to focus on ways to ensure or provide opportunities for individuals, both students and staff, to social distance when they're in the building. So reminders to staff to stay six feet apart looking at our common areas in the buildings and um, looking at them as spaces that we can use to spread out students um, if we're on an on-site or hybrid environment so a class can be um, more distance during learning or going the exact opposite direction and looking at closing down some of those spaces. So we simply eliminate that temptation for students or staff to congregate um, closely together in areas where we know it might be more likely for, for COVID um, spread. And then um, we are going to encourage staff that can uh, work remotely to continue to do so. Um, we're doing that this summer. We've not opened up our um, offices or our offices at our buildings completely because if folks can continue to work remotely, we want to continue to encourage uh, to do that. Um, we're gonna start the school year um, with, um, not uh, allowing visitors or volunteers into the buildings on a regular basis. We know that our community is a large part of what makes our schools function and what makes our schools great. But right now, we need to get our kids learning and we need to focus on health and safety. And so whenever we can limit additional people from being in the buildings, as tough as that might be, we think we need to do that. And so I wanted to make sure that I, that I, that I pointed out that because we know that that's um, and un, one of the many unfortunate byproducts of the situation we're currently in. But we're going to make the difficult decision to start the year um, by um, not allowing visitors or volunteers into our building during the school day or to coach in our, in our extracurricular activities or sponsor those events. Because again, those are folks that are outside uh, in the community and coming in on a daily basis is an exposure that we just don't think is necessary to our students at, at this point. But like with all of these, We'll continue to revisit and monitor them as, as we move forward throughout the summer and into the fall. And then lastly, um, we're going to continue our um, restriction on school sponsored or endorsed travel and limit that to um, travel in the state, both for students, uh, for competitions, and also for staff for PD. Um, and speaking of PD, I, I don't know if it's on this one or uh, a different slide, but PD, we are meetings, professional development, and curriculum planning will be done virtually. Again, if we can do it through Zoom, like we've done it for the last four months, we don't need to add the additional stress and health concern of bringing multiple people together um, in close proximity. A lot of information there. And again, it's not exhaustive of where we think this list will be by August 24th, but we do want to continue to provide detail on social distancing and health and safety. Questions before we move on to the next category, which is related to this. Okay, so related to that, health and safety is cleaning and sanitizing our buildings. Uh, 
Our physical plant has done a tremendous job keeping our buildings clean this spring and the summer and looking at what we can do on, on a daily basis next year as we prepare to keep our buildings clean and healthy as possible. And so there will be a daily cleaning and sanitizing routine accomplished by our physical plant. Um, in order for us to clean at the rate we believe is needed for um, uh, a high level of health and safety, classrooms and student desks will require participation of our, of our staff and students. Um, we're not sure that's gonna be at all levels. And of course, if there are staff and students that do need to wipe, even wipe a desk um, daily at the end of first period before students transition into the second period, we will train them on, on how to do that and the supplies that will be used. The supplies will all be provided by the district, so they'll meet our district uh, guidelines um, for, for safety, and then we will train individuals to do that. But again, when we look at our staffing and where we are in terms of uh, the people that we have available, our custodians are tremendous. Our entire fiscal plan is, and we've talked about reassigning folks if need be, but even doing so, in order for us to consistently clean desks and high touch areas inside classrooms, we're going to have to train some of our, um, our staff, our teachers and our students to, to help with that process. Um, we're doing that a little bit this summer um, in our weight rooms. Our ADs have been fantastic about working with their athletes as we reopen um, our, our gyms and our, our weight rooms and, and, and helping work with the athletes about, okay, Here's how you need to clean. Here's what you need to do before the next person does it to, again, help keep us all safe by doing those parts. Um, that's very brief on cleaning sanit sanitization, but um, any questions on that piece before we move to the daily health screeners? And the last piece for me for right now before I turn it back over to Matt is that daily health screener. If you remember in the in the spring, we set out guidelines, a, a verbal health screener for anyone visiting the building, staff and students. We utilized it uh, for baseball and softball. We continue to utilize it um, as we open up more activities. But as we start school, per guidance we've received from the CDC and other organizations, um, students, we're going to ask families to perform a daily health screener temperature check at home. Um, the, the most recent guidance that we, that we have gotten that says that's, that's where that should take place rather than at the school building. However, we are going to continue to do daily health screening temperature checks um, of staff upon arrival. Questions on those before Matt goes on to face coverings. So Chase, this is Charlie. This is Charlie. Um, um, can you tell us what the health and safety committee's approach has been or what their thinking has been about not, re not engaging in some kind of uh, uh, testing of viral load for swabs or serology? Um, I haven't noticed any of those elements as, as part of our plan so far. Of, um, uh, of everybody or of staff, Charlie? Oh, uh, yeah, of students or staff. Students may be a little more problematic, but staff at least anyway or for not having sure. it as a part of the sure and I'll, I'll let um i'll let kate and Dwayne talk about um talk about where the the conversation from the the committee has been on that i'm not sure i understand charlie are you referring to like um the covid testing and conducting that in schools uh yeah um uh, uh, either some kind of swab testing or uh, perhaps of serology to testing too. We've had some conversations about that. My understanding, and again, I, my understanding at this time is that our nurses would not have the authority to conduct that testing. We would have to give, we would have to come up with some type of, of an agreement with Johnson County um, or with our testing, with Test Iowa in order for them to conduct the testing. So we have had brief discussions about that and we have, we have some folks that are very interested in pursuing that because if we do send students home, we know that some will be able to go and get a test and others may not be able to right away. Um, we also would be concerned about 
um, the nurses that are on site to perform those kind of duties at that time. We just have nine nurses right now covering all the buildings. So those were some of the discussions. Okay, so I, what I'm understanding you're saying is that the, it's more of a capacity issue than, than a best practice issue. Is my fair in saying that or not? It's a capacity issue and then, um, and, I, and I'm not exactly sure of how this works, but right now, um, public health has the authority to conduct those tests and our district doesn't. So we would have to somehow um, ha have that authority. To yeah, Charlie, I think we could double check, but I'm not sure we've right. had any recommendations or guidance that we should, um, as a district, try to attempt to increase our, our testing, either capacity or ability to do that. I'm not sure we have the authorization to do that or that it's been recommended to us that we should look in um, to our ability to be able to test for COVID more frequently. I think our role is in the screening capacity and trying to get people to the health professionals that can conduct those tests on a, on a regular basis. Okay, thanks for the discussion and clarification that helps. Uh, so face coverings, I'm gonna move us on to that one. Um, we obviously uh, talked about that last week. Um, so just a couple additional pieces here uh, for you this evening. Um, Face coverings are required for staff and students while in school or on district property. Um, we've determined we'll provide a minimum of two face coverings for each student and staff member. How students are, however, students are encouraged uh, to bring their own if they so choose. We know that two, obviously, for a long school year um, is just a start. And so if, if people have their own and want to bring their own, of course, we would allow them to do that. Um, I would say as far as specific type, um, you know, there's conversations around masks and face shields. Uh, we're still actively working through guidance and, and recommendations on that component, but we did want to make it clear that we would be providing um, some of those uh, face coverings as well, because that was a frequent question, um, but that if people wanted to, to be able to bring their, their own, as long as it um, in the end com complies with what our recommendations are, of course, that'll be okay. Um, and then a special note around exceptions, it will be considered uh, on a case-by-case -case basis that it may not be feasible to wear uh, face coverings at all time are reasonable uh, to wear face coverings at all times. And then of course, uh, students with any medical exception where that would create a greater risk for them. We obviously don't wanna be doing harm uh, by that practice either. And so you can see the CDC guidance linked in there on that one, but um, that'd be the additional commentary around face coverings for this evening. And as we get into food and nutrition, um, menu items will either be served to students or served in individual packages to avoid commonly touched utensils. Um, so no more self-service uh, self would be part of our practice. Um, lunchrooms, classrooms, other common areas may be utilized for eating space. And so we know that's an active part of, of what we're working on is trying to look for uh, additional um, eating spaces for students outside of the, just the large lunchrooms or, or spaces we have now. Uh, disposable silverware uh, will be used. Uh, touchless payment process implemented. And then um, the continuation of the grab and go meals for all students in the offsite or uh, continuous online uh, learning experience um, will still be offered those grab and go meals, breakfast and lunch. And so we continue um, that programming as well. Matt, Questions well, on face coverings or lunch and nutrition or sorry, uh, nutrition? Well, I was gonna kind of jump onto the nutrition thing, but I do have a comment on face coverings and uh, maybe JP would speak to it. I know that, uh, you know, at the university and at the hospital, right, they're wearing the, the mask and a face shield and they do provide quite a bit of protection and allow for a little closer contact. But um, I do think uh, it is uh, much more difficult to communicate um, between a, a teacher and a student when you're wearing all that stuff. So it is something to, uh, to think about. It, it, it does offer a lot more safety to have both. But uh, my nutrition question was, you know, as you look at uh, different places for kids to eat lunch, whether it's classrooms or setting up in the gym or whatever other places there are, is that gonna be much more prescriptive and school by school? So, you know, Grant Wood, these are the places where kids can eat and, you know, Kirkwood, that this is where they can eat and things like that. Or we're not gonna sort of say, grab your food and go sit somewhere, right? Right, that'd be the thing, Sean. I think you zero into that one good. And sorry if I talked over Chase or somebody else. You're fine. But I think, you know, by campus, obviously the solution's different. 
And so depending on, on school site, uh, the solutions would be different, but you're right. I mean, there has to be some, some order and direction and guidance uh, provided in that sense. And so that's where we would work with those individual buildings to determine what spaces are available, what makes sense um, and what we can do moving forward there. So Chase, did you have something you wanted to add in there? No, that was the exact, that was the exact thing I was gonna offer. And then um, next one on here um, details health office procedures. Um, so health offices will include one space for healthy students coming uh, for routine uh, needs, medication, first aid, injury assessment. And then a uh, recommendation has been to provide a second space in the building that would be established for students and staff who are ill or require evaluation for possible infection, again, to limit exposure um, if we feel um, that that person could be potentially symptomatic uh, for the virus. And so uh, we're looking for a second space in the building to be able to handle that um, separate from uh, some of the more routine needs that we'd serve on a consistent basis to reduce that exposure. And then the last one on, on this slide, I believe, sun's starting to shine a little funky here. Um, details limiting student in school transitions. And so this talks about those transition opportunities and um, trying to minimize uh, those or limit those where we can. And so here we list out some following practices uh, to an extent possible that we would like to limit that. And so we talk about keeping small groups, for example, classroom students together as much as possible, uh, keep staff members with the same group of students uh, as, as much as possible, bring programs um, potentially like art, music, and counselors to classrooms rather than have students transport to different rooms is an idea we continue to work through. Uh, limit before and after school building access, um, trying to put some, some time frames or stipulations around that so we can do sufficient cleaning. Uh, utilize multiple drop off and pick up locations um, to limit again those, those transitions. Um, close uh, common spaces unless necessary for social distancing. You heard Chase uh, talk about that um, a little bit earlier in, in reference. That could also be a solution around those common spaces. Uh, use classroom and outdoor spaces uh, for potential uh, eating breakfast uh, or lunch in addition to the cafeteria. So um, nothing's really off the table for us as we continue to look at those. So that, that one you've seen kind of come up in a couple different areas, but it's also here under the uh, transitions component. And then consider using those common spaces for classrooms if we would need to. So um, Chase did a nice job of drawing that parallel earlier between uh, maybe needing to close them in some instances and then maybe be able to repurpose them in some other instances. Questions on any of those? Um, I have a question on the um, the health office stuff. Uh, you know, it's been you know brought up you know in a couple of emails about the staffing and whatnot. I do like the idea of having two separate areas um, for the different types of services being provided there, but then that does raise the question who's um, expected to be staffing those areas and will we have the ability to do that adequately at all of our schools. So, so that's, a, that's certainly a question. Um, I know that as I think about, you know, kids moving around in a school, um, I'm, I'm thinking I had one of my very early questions was what do we do with specials, right? And I saw that they were in the schedule and you just kind of mentioned there about potentially bringing them to the rooms. I, I'm leery to say that, you know, you, you put kids, cram them all into a room and, you know, they're wearing their masks and they're sitting in their regimented seats and not really getting to move around a lot. I, I think uh, anytime they're not able to uh, maybe transition to another place, I mean, it's going to make the, just the, it's going to make school kind of unbearable in, in a certain regard. So I'd be for allowing them to move. We can figure out how to move them around safely if they needed to go to, um, you know, as a, as a cohort, right? I think you can probably work in the schedule. So not all kids are elementary specifically are moving around at the same time, but a class could be moving to, um, you know, an, an art class or something like that. But you've got to then figure out how to, add in any sort of um, extra cleaning that would have to happen in between uh, those groups of kids moving around. So you'd have to build that in there. And I think somewhere along the way, somebody, had, I think it was Lisa asked about the kind of like the schedule and, and Matt, you mentioned maybe what's between the start and stop time might look different where maybe passing times might have to be 
edited a little bit and not every class is exactly the right time, but I'd be, I'd be for uh, kids being able to, to at least get a change of scenery once in a while throughout the day to not make it feel very isolating. But that's my two cents on that one. No, I think we certainly understand that, Sean. I mean, it, it's a trade-off, right? I mean, for some of those things that, you know, we'd like students to be able to do, it kind of goes back to some of the contract or contact tracing uh, conversation around if um, students are, if there's several students in multiple spaces, then it becomes really hard to narrow down uh, students that are potentially affected um, by, by an exposure uh, to COVID and, and to know how to isolate that in any way. And so, there's a trade-off, right? I mean, obviously you're identifying some of the teach and learning concerns of that component, right? Keeping them in the same room for an extended period of time without the opportunity to get out there. We know that's not great. I mean, that's, that's part of the solution or, or part of the challenge in front of us, excuse me, um, around this that, you know, any of these trade-offs are not the way we would like to do it. And so you're exactly right. I mean, you're trading one thing uh, kind of for another in either of those scenarios, but I do think that's rooted in some of that health and safety recommendation around the, the contact tracing and knowing that if there was an exposure, how large that group uh, would be of who was potentially exposed to it. So we can continue. Matt, guess, Matt the thing I would add on that is, Sean, um, I think we agree with you that we, that we know that students need to get up and move around. And that's why you see in the recommendations, the use of uh, larger common spaces are also outdoors as the school year begins so that they can have that change of scenery. When we talk uh, specifically about some of the specialist program, Matt is right on those trade-offs because um, it generates another level of concern, concern if you have 10 different groups of 20 to 30 students in the same small place within a five hour, hour period, right? And so I, I think that as you look at, at how that um, expands uh, the contact that people, that students have with each other, that teachers have with each other, um, we want to look at some of those alternatives and finding other ways for them to get that spacing, whether it's having class for a couple hours outside or in a different different space in the building, but still looking at it so you don't have different cohorts of students using the exact same space repeatedly without having the opportunity to do the cleaning that we need to inside. And so it is a trade-off, it is a balancing act. And, and quite honestly, we know that there that every decision is going to be tough. And, and it's it's not um, um, going to be able to be the way that, that we're used to having school. And, and that's unfortunate, but we do want to try to maintain the health and safety the, the best that we can. And so to kind of add on to your uh, thoughts there, Chase, about maintaining or uh, achieving as much health and safety as we possibly can. I, again, I would like to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to urge us to follow the recommendations of the Health and Safety Committee about having uh, additional medical assistance available uh, for uh, the different for different buildings, you know, nine nurses. It's a lot of work where that are, those nine nurses are going to be asked to do uh, over the course of this fall and winter. So uh, <clears throat> I know this is a budget thing, but uh, if we can, uh, if it's appropriate to increase our uh, medical staff to, uh, to an appropriate extent, I hope we will uh, attempt to do that. And I'm, I don't, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'm going to add a, a little bit of perspective. I, I know a little bit about how uh, the county and other folks are doing contact tracing, and it's not, you know, who's been in a room, you know, at some point during the same day. It's close contact, which is an extended period of time in person with other people. Um, and that's how we've been directed at work to do things too. That's how we've done um, pretty consistently with how we're segregating our shifts from each other. So my department is split into, you know, we're a 24 seven operation, but we're split into three different shifts that no longer overlap that has cleaning in between. And that is, has been deemed sufficient. And I think if we can figure out how to sufficiently clean an area in between groups going in, I think you're still, meeting the directives from uh, the CDC and the Johnson County Public Health. So I, I don't know that it's necessarily, uh, I don't think you, you have to say that different kids can't be in the same place at different points in time. I don't think that's an accurate reflection of the guidance, but I could be wrong. And I understand that you're trying to uh, 
make sure everybody is safe and that's a priority. So I'm just adding my perspective onto it as a kind of a counter to some of that uh, uh, guidance they have so far. I'll just add that I'm looking at the CDC guidance right now and it says close communal use share spaces as much as possible. Um, so I, I, I actually do think that there is some, some science behind limiting all of the places that kids come into contact with in the building. And I think we can, you know, we'll continue to explore that when it's on there is, you know, um, to the extent possible, right? And we still have some work to do in that regard. And, and I think both, um, you know, those points are, are valid ones and ones we need to uh, consider and keep trying to work through. Um, like, like we said, we felt the responsibility to try to bring you some of the information we've talked through and some of the points we're considering. Um, and so I, I appreciate the feedback on that one and we can continue to uh, discuss and, and work in our teams about how that might look. So thanks for that. Okay, Matt, I think it's, I think it's back it's to me. Training, right? yep. I think I'm actually gonna take technology first and then we'll come back to the model transition protocols. Adam and his team have done a fantastic job um, since uh, uh, we started uh, facing the, the pandemic in, in March as we rolled out um, technology upgrades and, and devices to, to all of our students. And so you see there a couple of the bullets of things that, um, for the most part, Adam's team and, and everyone that's been involved has, has really already gotten up and running. Like uh, most areas, there, there's more detail behind this, but you see a number of those bullets, um, the one-to-one -one devices. Um, all of our teachers and administrators provided Zoom uh, for licenses so that we can fully utilize this platform when we are doing um, distance, uh, distance uh, teaching and learning. The, we have Canvas and the Seesaw platform, so along with the G, uh, the G Suite available for um, delivery. And you know, I think lastly, and, and, and really most importantly, we're committed uh, to facilitating internet access for our students that, that lack um, those resources at home. Um, that should not be a barrier to our students being able to engage in learning. And so we are um, committed to, to helping make that happen for our families. So if they are at home, they can um, obtain education just like they're, they're in the classroom. Questions on that, on that technology um, piece this evening? So Chase, this is Charlie again. Uh, I've talked about this before. How do you think we're doing in terms of uh, securing, getting internet access to all of the students in the district at home? I think we're doing well. Um, I know Adam has um, actual uh, probably data on that. So I'll let Adam speak a little more in, in depth of, of where we are in terms of, of Yeah, I think at this point we have, well, we've provided home internet to every family who has requested it at least um, up until, you know, the last couple days. Um, so we've provided internet based upon requests. That said, we know that we need to do and outreach, especially once we have a little bit more clarity. So hopefully, um, you know, within a couple of weeks here, we know that we'll have to do some outreach to families again um, to, again, generate those requests for internet that's needed in the home. The service that we have, we're now able to partner with um, multiple ISPs in the community to provide perhaps a little bit quicker rollout. Um, certainly a lot quicker than what we experienced in the fall, but even a little bit quicker than the normal two week turnaround that we would have. Um, so that, you know, gives us some good options regardless of where somebody is at within the district. In terms of percentages, it's a little bit tough to calculate because when we provide home internet, we're providing it to, you know, a, a family upon request, we ask for a student's name, but often only one student's name is given. Um, whereas there are frequently multiple students within that household. So we know that we've provided that home internet service to, at this point, I think we're at about um, 1,300 students. In reality, that's probably 1,300 households and the actual number of students is higher. Um, we also know from data that we had earlier, but also data that we recently collected as part of a survey that we just got results from a few days ago, um, that it's pretty likely if we assume that the average household we've provided internet access to has, you know, around 
around two kids on average, um, that it's pretty likely that we're pretty near saturated with our student population from last year. Um, that said, we know we'll have new students, new preschoolers, new kindergartners, and just students who are new to the district, not to mention students whose circumstances have changed. So really trying to keep on top of it again, we'll have a renewed push to generate those requests here um, as we move forward in July. But at this point, we, we think we're doing pretty well. Okay, Th thanks Adam, that was really helpful. Uh, Chase and Matt, and I think we're, uh, part of our plan really relies upon in classroom teachers and uh, school principals to follow up to make and ensure that uh, every uh, child in their classroom or in their building actually has the service that they need to participate. Uh, would we say that that effort is a, a being uh, uh, is going along well at this point? Yes, I think so. I mean, we've uh, Adam um, can probably attest, and so can Matt and I, that we've had a number of, of principals and, and teachers and student family advocates. Uh, reaching out to us about services that are needed. And so I think that our teachers, as always, are, are doing a fantastic job connecting with their students and, and making sure that they're being able to um, connect with them not only academically, but also socially, emotionally, uh, so that they have those uh, needs being met. We can provide those services. We know that one thing we've worked on with um, the equity team and, um, and Lisa and Laura and others are how can we improve some of those uh, some of those outreach pieces when we started in March we put in some very strict guidelines about um, contact uh, with families because we were you know trying to navigate this new pandemic and we understand that there are some things that we are going to do a little bit differently um, this fall as we return to school to make sure that Charlie we are keeping those relationships but um, I know that's a little bit more than you ask, but I would say yes, that, that our teachers, our principals, and our support staff are, are, are doing a tremendous job to connect um, with their students and, um, and, and get them prepared for what learning is going to look like uh, when, we, when we get to August. Okay, thanks very much, Chase. So the last thing we'd like to, to talk to uh, you tonight uh, in terms of the plan and what we're sharing is what we're calling the model transition protocols. And this has come up in questions and part of our return to learn plan, we had to provide a model for continuous online learning as well as looking at what on site would look like in a hybrid, which we've shown you. But um, while we are going to, and Matt talked about this at the top, um, ask the board to provide us some direction of how we're going to start the school year we know that health and safety concerns primarily if there is a positive case of COVID in a school community or in several of school communities might force us to move a classroom, a school, or even the entire district into our offsite continuous learning model. And so we've done some work led by the health and, and safety team in conjunction with the Johnson County Health Department um, and some local um, doctors about what that might look like. And we've come up with this document, Matt, if you wanna go ahead and open that up, that allows us to talk through what some of those um, crucial points might be where we would transition, a, again, a classroom, a school, or even the district to continuous online learning. For the sake of time and for discussion, Matt, I'm gonna skip the, the general guidelines. I'll just talk about them briefly. What we provide at the, at the outset is, um, an overview of if somebody tests positive or symptomatic, what if they're asymptomatic positive, we talked about close contact, what does that mean? Um, and then what about if you test negative, when can you come back to school? And then I am gonna pause here at this last definition of close contact. Uh, and because I think um, if you follow the developments from the CDC and uh, COVID in general, um, the six feet rule is something that we've become very familiar with. And it used to be 10 minutes, uh, the newest guidance says for approximately 15 minutes. In our health and safety committee's work with Johnson County Public Health, they've actually established a second definition for close contact, and that is being in a room with an infected individual for two or more consecutive hours. And when we asked Johnson County about this, it's, it's footnoted at, at the bottom, but I, I will go ahead and read it. It's in pretty small type there. Is that, uh, they said that the two hour exposure uh, rule is currently a local guideline and that we're including the two hour guidance 
based on the mounting evidence that COVID can be transmitted by smaller droplets than previously believed and guidelines from other respiratory diseases. And that came to us uh, just yesterday, even though we've been doing this work. So we followed up with them even yesterday about that. And why that's important is because as you look at these transition points, it impacts what we might look at at the elementary level in terms of what we look at at, at junior and uh, junior high and, and high school. And so starting at that classroom level, the, the current guidance that, that we're proposing would be that if a student or staff member tested positive in an elementary classroom, the students and staff in the class would have to transition to continuous online, online learning for 14 days. We hear that 14 day quarantine period as being the norm. And based on the CDC guidance and the local guidance, that is the suggestion. Um, and they're using that two hour, two consecutive hours of, of contact in the room as why at the elementary level, we would transition the entire classroom to continuous online learning for that, that period. And so that, is our, that would be our first trigger point, that if there was a positive case in an elementary classroom, that um, the entire class would transition to online learning for a period of about two weeks. It would extend a little bit further than that. Um, we know that we have lots of families in the district. And so if the individual that was testing positive was a student and had siblings at other schools, those siblings would also have to uh, move to continuous online learning. If it was a staff member that had students in the, in the district, that staff member students would have to, just like if it was a student that tested positive and they had a parent that was an employee in district, anyone that was living in the household where the positive case was would have to also abide by that 14 day um, continuous learning uh, transition and quarantine. At the secondary level, it's a little bit different and it gets uh, somewhat more complicated because we are, are using a different approach, but at the same time, it's a little bit simpler because I think it's more familiar with what we talk about in terms of that close contact and working with um, Johnson County Public Health, the recommendation is that because class periods are roughly 45 to 50 minutes at the secondary level, if there was a positive case, the only individuals that would have to move to continuous online learning and quarantine would be students or staff that sat within six feet of the, of the student or the staff member that had a positive case. And so where the elementary we would transition an entire classroom of students. We would really use more of that contract tracing and we would uh, work with Johnson County Public Health, obviously to, to do that and make those decisions. But looking at that more traditional six foot radius um, in over 15 minutes, if you're in a class together for 45 minutes, it's obviously more than 15 if you're sitting within six feet. Um, that's what we would use for that, for that radius. We have similar guidance about the six feet for on um, school buses or in district transportation. Everything uh, tied to that 14 day um, transition or excuse me, that transition for 14 days to continuous online learning in the home quarantine. And then um, students participating in co-curricular extracurricular activities. This is the one that we've had the um, most experience with exploring. This is the same guideline that we activated at the beginning of June when we brought on softball and baseball. And so um, we've been utilizing this guidance um, so far in terms of, of what we've been looking at and we'll continue that um, as we get into um, the school year about if you're participating in a co-curricular activity and a student um, uh, or a coach or sponsor test positive for COVID. 19. Now, we understand that there might be more than one positive um, case at a time. And so after looking at the classroom, we had to look at it from the school context. And so again, working with local physicians and the Johnson County Public Health, that if a school were to experience three or more positive cases in different classrooms um, within an overlapping time period. So we would have three different positive cases in three different classrooms, all within that, that two week school period. So you would have basically three school, uh, three classrooms at the same time. We would then move the entire school to continuous online learning for, for two weeks. Um, and so again, it, it's not three cases, maybe even the same classroom. It would be three positive cases in different classrooms in a school building 
we would move the entire um, we would move the entire school to continuous online learning for a two week period. And then if we take that out one more uh, one more layer to the district, um, if we had three schools that had three cases in different classrooms all in the overlapping period, we would move the entire district to um, continuous online learning for, for 14 days. And you might at first blush think, wow, Chase, that, uh, that's, um, that's pretty extreme. And um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations around that, but, but we don't think so. I mean, because if you really do the numbers, what you're talking about is you're talking about nine different individuals that test positive for COVID within a two week period that are in different schools or different parts of that school. And when you look at having multiple uh, positive cases in three of our different schools, that's over, a third, that's over 10% of our buildings, right? If we have three schools that have three or more cases, that's 10% of our buildings with at least three cases. And so we think um, that is substantial enough that we would move the entire um, district to continuous online learning for a period of 14 calendar days or about two weeks. Um, you know, hopefully uh, we see things improve over the fall, but if they would not improve and we would have a second experience where we had that same scenario um, um, pop up, we would then move the entire district to continuous on learning um, until uh, December 18th at least, and then re reevaluate. Because while we want to have points in place that we can transition to other models, we don't want to continue to hop back and forth every two, every three weeks. And so we're going to have to make some of those decisions. This last point about building access during continuous learning that we would um, keep the buildings open, um, administration, uh, office and support staff may be required to report. Uh, teaching staff um, could have the option to teach from their classroom or from an alternative location during that, that period. Of course, employees that were in the exposed classroom or exposed to a student would have to self-quarantine and would not be able to access the buildings during that time. We would take the buildings through deep cleaning and sanitizing procedures during that period. Um, and, and the district will obviously provide some additional guidance to impacted employees as we flush out this general guidance, but as we, we get to uh, closer to, to any of those circumstances. And I'm sure there are a number of questions. I think one uh, question that might just pop up at that paragraph is, well, Chase, why in the world would you, would you leave the buildings open? Why wouldn't you just shut them down? That's because of the current guidance we have from the Department of Education and, and, and the governor's office in terms of how the regulations and the laws have been written around our authority to fully close down our, our buildings. Um, we have to have a emergency declaration from the governor in order to fully close down our buildings. We do not have that as of now, beginning October, uh, August 24th. And so by law, we will have to keep the buildings open. And so we will keep the buildings open, um, although we will still have our students in a continuous um, online learning model. And so uh, again, we wanna stay legal, but we also wanna make sure that we're protecting the health and safety of our students. And so we feel like this is the way we can do both of those, but um, we're hopeful and we're advocating that we get an additional um, emergency declaration from the governor that would give us that authority to close down the buildings and, and we wouldn't need to activate that cost. Uh, that's just a small caveat I wanted to make sure I articulated, um, but I, I know I ran through that very quickly, but I didn't wanna leave uh, time for your questions. So we can take some questions on this area as well. Um, I have a question about the negative and no close contact. Um, are we going to require proof of a negative test in order for somebody to fall under that? Um, sorry, this let me. Oh, uh, And I was getting some. I, I mean, it, I, so this. I sure. So this came. I mean, this this language is taken right from a document, or very, you know, paraphrased just a touch from a document from the uh, Iowa Department of Public Health. And we, as I said, we've had the Johnson County Public Health look at it. My interpretation of that reading that would say yes, they tested that they tested 
negative um, the, the way it's written in order for them to return. But if you've been in close contact and you don't get tested, you're going to have to quarantine for 14 days. And then, and, and that's, I'm thinking of the situation where we have a student at a school who um, mid school day develops a 104 fever and is coughing. So they obviously have the symptoms. They're sent home. Um, they say that they get tested and they're negative. Do they need to send proof of that negative test to school before they're allowed back? Or are we just going to take the word for it that they're negative? Like in order to exempt out of the 14 day quarantine, sure. are we going to require some proof? Kate, do you know, has the committee talked about that? I know there was a little bit of discussion, but I don't know if you ever came to a conclusion on that, on that specific detail. No, we did not come to a conclusion on that. I think in some way, Lisa, we'd probably want some verification there, a, a note in some way, you know, I mean, um, that they're, you know, safe to be back at school, that they've gotten the negative test. If we were going to close that 14 day window, um, I think we would want to explore that. So we'll continue to work to get an answer on that one. I think that's a, that's a great question as part of that. And, and that would be in line with our current practices around our staff um, in our negotiated agreements. Uh, the board actually in state law has that right to ask for, for documentation regarding, regarding illness. So um, it is a good point to bring up. And so we can continue to, to flesh that out as another detail that we need to um, look at and potentially add that clarifying language. There's some stuff in the in the general guidelines there at the beginning of that document, right, that talks about um, at least 10 days from the onset of symptoms and three days from the end of symptoms. It doesn't mm -hmm. mention anywhere in there about testing. Um, I know that uh, one of the things that has been brought up in different conversations than this one is um, they're doing a test and then they're recommending um, a test again 10 days later um, because the viral load isn't always high enough to get a positive test the first time. Um, so one test in and of itself hasn't always been um, the most meaningful. So that's also something to think about. And I, I, don't, I don't know where those guidelines came from. I think that's a Johnson County thing, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, another question, when an entire class, so elementary classroom, has to transition to online learning, um, and, and again, this is me just trying to understand the opt-in online track and how it relates to the mandatory online track. Do you envision that that teacher that is also at home quarantining will lead Zoom meetings and, and what, online meetings? Do you envision that those students will slide over to the parallel optional online track? Um, what will learning look like when a classroom has to quarantine for two weeks? Yeah, good question, Lisa. Some of this has to be parsed out. Um, is that okay, Chase? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, Lisa, you're, you're asking all the questions. We're having ongoing conversations on around the table. I mean, Amy, um, do you want to add anything about thinking right now? Yeah, that uh, we're pretty confident in saying that they wouldn't jump over. And I know Matt doesn't want to use the term virtual academy, but the um, online continuous online virtual opportunity that parents can opt into right away at the beginning of the year. We don't see uh, for that 14 days that they would tr transition to that. The other thing about it, because it's happening at the classroom level, we couldn't necessarily employ the exact continuous learning schedule that you see um, linked in there because of um, the times of day you see interventions happening or the special schedule happening aren't gonna line up necessarily when the staff who are back in the building still have access to that group of students. So um, we need to work through that schedule a little bit more, but by and large, we would be using Canvas, we'd be using Zoom still, we would be uh, uploading our videos there. So um, you could say that uh, fairly loosely that schedule will be used, but it wouldn't be exact. Paul, I know you said you were collecting all your questions till the end. I think we got to the end of the document, so I don't know if it's time for you to jump in there, unless uh, Matt or Chase had 
more to throw out here for us. No, I think I can run back to kind of the uh, slides that were uploaded on board docs here and um, see where you guys would like to go or additional board members have questions or Paul, yeah. wherever you'd like to go here, Sean and guys. I'll just, I'll just jump in since Sean called me out there a little. Um, I will, I do have a list, like I said, and some of these things you um, may not be able to answer. So just let me know if that's the case, like if it's a future thing that you need to um, discuss. Uh, and in regards to the hybrid model, have, have you guys, or are you able to run a, um, a scenario to see what that alphabet split looks like and what the class loads break down to for each elementary? Does that make sense? Um, or, or, you know, for that, especially that five, sixth grade and, and some of those classes, um, that'd be my first question. I would say the quick answer to that, Paul, is no. Um, I think that would be something that um, as we get closer to knowing if we were going to employ that model, then we would start to do that and look at specific numbers around that and problem solve those. Because um, what I'm hearing you say is essentially breaking it down by alpha and then um, knowing how many kids we're looking at in each of those sections based on the amount of students that are there. And so we haven't drilled down to that level of detail, but I, you know, that's a step we would quickly take um, if we were going to pursue the the AB option as one we were going to begin with. Yeah, and I should have started with saying that um, just as an overall uh, comment on this whole thing, like I really appreciate all the work that's going into this. The number one question I think all board members and most of you guys can probably um, say you're getting is when will you make a decision and what will that decision be? But I do appreciate that we're taking the time to make the right decision for everyone or um, and the best we can and not a rushed decision because we found uh, rush decisions don't always seem to work out the best. Um, well, the reason I asked the question about the model um, is because I'm wondering if uh, at some point people may look at what that may look like and that may determine if they decide to send their kids to school or if they opt out. Um, if that, you know, if somebody's concerned about having a large class uh, on their side of the alphabet versus a smaller class, that may determine if they opt in or out. And that's just kind of one of the, I guess I was thinking uh, about that model thing. So um, they're just kind of moving down. Uh, some of the programs like the Castle program at Southeast um, is kind of a group based learn thing. And so would you just envision that, that this year that model would have to kind of be put on hold in some ways um, to accomplish the stuff that you guys are proposing here? Yeah, I think that's a great specific question about how we'd consider some of those alternative programming efforts. I mean, some of our larger uh, classes or group offerings in Castle is a good example of, of that, where we'd have an increased amount of students, um, you know, coming into contact with each other. The secondary one is just a different challenge in general uh, from being mixed uh, students all day long because of a lot of their classes, it's not like they work through the their schedule in a cohort model. So I think that question, we probably want to work with the Southeast team to know if we're putting kids more at risk there. Um, are there things they could still do through Castle that would mitigate some of the risk? But I think that's a great example, Paul, of probably a unique circumstance that as we turn some of these protocols over to the buildings, we would have to help them work through about what makes the most sense to deliver that service. Uh, and then, like I said, I'm, it's, I'm jumping around a little bit because I just made a ton of notes, but uh, disposable silverware, does, does that have any chance of being recycled? Um, I, I don't know if I'm the best person to uh, answer the detail level on that question, uh, but I know we've talked recycling obviously some this past year and that um, looking at that uh, disposable silverware was, was not um, highly thought of, I guess I would say, from, from some of the conversations we had. And so I think we could look, at for, look for some increased efforts to recycle. Um, obviously, we don't want to create another health and safety problem by, you know, uh, trying to uh, maybe step into a new practice or something either, but we could look at it. I don't, I don't have a great answer. I don't think we necessarily considered that a yes or no, or maybe Allison's got a different answer that I'm not aware of, but um, I'm not I exactly sure how we'd handle that detail yet. Sure. Initially, I think we were going to lead off with um, a spork, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and that's packaged with a napkin just for ease in um, you know, for less handling and just one and done for the students to take. 
I, I do know we can buy compostable silverware. All of those things come at a cost and the current plastic silverware that we have used may be recyclable. Um, we'd have to investigate more into that. Um, just kind of moving on. Um, do you envision any classes mainly at the secondary level um, not being possible to be held? And if so, um, schedule adjustments that may be need to be made for that first trimester? Or, um, will that be something that's possible and, and that you're looking at for students if they maybe a course can't be held or it needs to be adjusted? Yeah, so some of the scheduling gets into the, and Diane may have some additional information she'd want to provide here, but the scheduling then gets into the staffing conversation. It's hard to talk about scheduling without staffing, um, but depending on, again, percentage of parents that, that select a certain option and what that does to um, maybe favorably lower some class sizes or to lower them to the point where we're not sure they're sustainable, I think we'd have to look at that, but I, I don't think we also um, want to make peer, people fearful that we won't be able to deliver on the classes they've, they've signed up for, that we do have a master schedule to deliver on those, and so we would like to do that. Um, but I don't think we'd also be doing our job if we weren't looking at where there's some sections we could put together or consolidate. But um, some of that will just depend on uh, probably students that would um, say if we were on the on-site model would decide to pursue that verse if they wouldn't. Um, but we would like to run that, that schedule. I think that's where we're starting from is that we don't want to take away those opportunities or have to do anything like that. But um, we'll just monitor it as it goes and work with the, the teachers and principals in those buildings. This one might be for uh, Dwayne, um, who I like is listed on our screen as Chase Ramey as well. Um, he, Dwayne, uh, what, is there any concern with the um, number of portables that are being used right now for construction and just the um, size of those classrooms? I know in a certain schools had put older kids out there uh, in the portables and, and that um, Obviously, older kids are bigger, and so they take up more space. So is that something you guys have covered with the number of construction projects we have going on right now? Well, I think one of the questions I, that I read was, will they have water and hand washing available? The 10-plex and the 6-plex do, and several of the duplexes do. Not all units do, so we'll have to investigate that. Uh, and as far as classroom size, they tend to be smaller. The actual physical space is smaller than the typical classroom in the building. So uh, we may, if we, depending on which model we go to, we may want to limit the number of students in those rooms. Uh, we did do some modeling this past weekend uh, out at Hoover Elementary and determined that we could easily fit, as Amy indicated earlier, 20 students in a room and maintain the three foot social distancing. Uh, but beyond that is not, not doable. So I, I would my answer to you is we'll have to investigate those rooms. I know they're a little bit smaller. How much I can't tell you at the moment. Sure. Um, and then uh, staff wise, um, once we make the decision which way we're going, if staff tends to choose to opt out, could you envision any assignments changing? Uh, and so that would maybe not be a by choice, but by default, I guess. Is that something that you, Amy and, and Matt? You guys um, sure. It's, it's, yes. I mean, Paul, it's, it's possible. And we tried to have a lot of conversations with, uh, with Brady about that and, and what, you know, we have to look at when we look at staffing. And by the way, Matt, I haven't forgotten that Brady wants to share some information too this evening. Um, but, you know, we try to try to keep that an open dialogue with the association and it goes back to the importance of um, once we know what model we're going to utilize to start the school year, getting a survey out to our teachers so we can get that information back. I think we'll have a much better idea of what type of staffing adjustments we might have to make after we, after we get that information. It's kind of like trying to use a crystal ball at this point, um, but we, we are aware that might be a, a necessity. And then Chase, since I have you right now, um, supplies wise, um, do are we stocking up now? Do you envision any kind of, I mean, obviously all schools that are going to be going back will be cleaning and uh, that's gonna ramp up. So do, are we planning for that hopefully so we don't have a shortage of any of those things? Um, we are, uh, Dwayne and uh, Dave McKenzie before he retired and, and Jessica Jimerson 
um, have been conver- have been having conversations and we've started to buy uh, some things. Um, I think it is going to be kind of a, a race to get supplies a little bit, just because like you said, every school and, and school district and lots of other businesses too, are going to be looking for the same, the same things. And so we've been contacting suppliers and seeing what's available and, and not waiting until August 15th to start looking at, at buying some of those um, items that we know that we'll need. So, um, you know, I, I don't think we could say with confidence that we have, we'll have enough on day one of the school year to, to last us all through, the, all through the year, but we are already making those preparations right now um, to get the supplies that, that, that we think we'll need. And then just my last question, um, when we finally do make a decision and we are moving forward, um, is there a plan maybe to have, I, I don't know the right way to word it, but I, I wrote down parent orientation uh, or multiple parent orientations, maybe led by um, building principal uh, or whatnot, where parents will be able to get on and, and kind of learn um, the model going forward and the expectations and things of that nature. Yeah, I, I think so, uh, Paul. Um, you know, I think that needs to be part of our communication strategy is how we uh, continue to share out some of this information and answer parent qu- questions. And I would say when we considered that equity component, that was one piece of feedback we got is continuing to look at the different modes and mediums we communicate with people that, um, you know, these are uh, big, intense conversations with, um, you know, lots of documents and, and lots of uh, points of information to consider and it's just a lot for families to process and so some more of those question and answer opportunities or um, video opportunities we can provide I think uh, what you'll continue to see from us is is looking to explore those and create some different opportunities whether that's at a site-based level or even at the district level uh, to engage in in some of that work so so thanks for bringing that up I, I know that's not something we talked about tonight but it's something we are looking at doing. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, a lot of people covered a lot of my questions. Um, what about traveling staff? Yeah, that's kind of in that staffing component. I think we'd like to bring some more information on next week, JP, but that's um, to Chase telling Lisa, you know, that she was talking about a lot of the things we were talking about. That's definitely one we've considered too about how that affects traveling staff and um, in between different buildings in that component. And so um, that'll be a continual conversation we'll work on. And Again, I, I don't want to keep kicking it back to that, but um, and I don't want to interrupt your other questions, but again, once we have a model that allows us to uh, problem solve some of those specific challenges, but that's definitely one that's that's on our radar and one we need we know needs to be accounted for. And have, have other activities started this summer other than baseball and softball? Any camps or that kind of stuff? So are we, um, how does that work? Say a basketball camp. What's that so, look like right now? Yeah, so Chase, can I take those? Sure. So camps haven't started yet. Uh, we have um, opened up the, the possibility of, of camps towards the end of July, but um, we have opened up facilities for off-season training. And so um, I was talking with um, one of the ADs this morning, and we were talking about the weight room, and that they're limiting it to – um, 20, 20 students at a time, which is much lower than the capacity. Each station is, is uh, they, they've gotten spread at, at stations that are more than six feet apart. And they've changed the way they're rotating between stations. What I might do a circuit three times, but they're doing all their work at that station before they rotate. And um, you know, I mentioned earlier, they're doing some of that cleaning uh, before they rotate. And so um, maybe that's more specifics than you, than you wanted, JP, but I mean, I think we're using that model um, similarly with other things that are going on. We, we put guidelines in place about when we expected um, players and coaches in baseball and softball to social distance and to wear masks. And so we lifted those up and said, okay, these same things are going to be in place for other activities. The other um, um, program that we have going on is we have, uh, Amy, correct if I'm wrong, but I think five before and after school programs operating in elementary schools right now. And we put in screenings um, in the morning when the students and the staff arrive. We've limited their, the size of the groups to uh, no more than 
um, nine students and one adult. If they want two adults, so the size of the group of students needs to reduce. Um, making sure that they have a space, but uh, being contained in that space throughout the course of the program. So uh, again, we can not only practice social distancing, but try to keep that group of students together um, as, uh, as much as possible. And so um, for the most part, you know, people are, are, are following the rules and they're taking it seriously, which I think is a testament to our community and our school district. If people um, are taking the health and safety pieces, um, and they're seeing them as important and, and we're taking them seriously as we move through the summer. So yes, there are some other things where we're gearing up and looking at more things to come online as we get closer to um, uh, to the fall. Scott's not here this evening, but he's also had conversations about how we're going to restart music programs and some of those as well. But um, it's kind of just one day and, and one program at a time a little bit, JP. Yeah, no, I appreciate, no, I appreciate this. this. I appreciate I the specificity. specificity. Um, I did play football in high school, believe it or not, and I'm not imagining how they're going to stay six feet apart. Agreed. JP, I can just jump in and say, I do know that um, like basketball and volleyball has started up doing some stuff that's um, open gym style stuff. And traditionally, I think a lot of that would be um, more, you know, um, uh, scrimmages or whatnot. But the focus this year has kind of shifted to individual drills so that you're staying away from that type of stuff. So I, I know that that's my daughter plays soft or volleyball and that's kind of been the discussion there. And I know that's the basketball side, at least for girls, is going that way. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. Question, um, Chase, Matt, or anybody else on the team. Are, do you envision that as we get closer to school starting, um, will we offer people an opportunity to do any self-reporting? Um, as if, like if we're a week out and somebody tests positive, a family, will there be some way for people to notify the district call or survey or something because I don't want people to think that they have to deal with it alone as we get closer to school starts instead of bringing these people back into the building and then all of a sudden we get that information. Kate, do you have anything from health and safety you want to say before I answer that question? No. Okay. So I, Ruthina, I, I do think that's a, that's a wise thought as far as if, if people wanted to uh, try to notify a, and self-report in that sense so they could let others know. Um, I'm not sure that we have discussed that particular piece or option yet. And so um, I'm going to make a note of that one here and come back for if people do, did want to self-report. I think in um, most instances um, we would have some people not show up to activities or not show up to school. And then sometimes that information is shared. But I think in this particular situation, we should be intentional around um, if, they're, if they're willing to share that information, giving them an opportunity and avenue to do that. So thanks for that. And I think, Matt, I think that underscores the point that Paul made about, Paul, what'd you call it? I can't remember what you called it, but like the, the sessions that we have with the, the community after we select the, the plan or the approach to let them know those things because to JP's question, Rathina, we've seen, I believe, people over reporting to us this summer in our activities, which is a good thing. Coming to us and saying, hey, my son that's not on the baseball team works with the person and that person's brother tested positive for COVID. I just wanted you to know, or do we, does that impact our student? And I think that's because of the way the ADs and coaches were able to communicate to their teams. And so the more that we can do that this summer after we know what we're doing, or even before that, right? If we know some of these guidelines that aren't model dependent, that will help us create those, those two-way communications. But that is a good thought and, and to add to what we want to hear back from families. And another quick thought is, is there any um, chance that, I mean, we all know Johnson County, we've added over 600 positive cases in a very short amount of time. Is there anything that would cause us to switch to a completely online version if community spread continues on a path that we see it being on right now? 
I'm not sure I, I heard all that completely there, Ruthina, but I think you said, is there something, is there something that would trigger us to um, make an, are you talking to kind of about the start of the school year about if we continue to see community spread the way it is now, you know, would we feel comfortable starting the school year? I think that's the conversation we're trying to have with you guys and, and maybe some of that, that frame of reference is some of those uh, data points we gave you in the transition models, um, kind of assessing the current state of the community against those transitioning models. I think it was maybe Director Williams last time that talked about not starting in a model and then needing to transition right away. And so what gives us the best chance about uh, trying to exist for a period of time in one and then then making a solid transition to another if it's if it's to increase or even if we do have to go backwards, but not starting so quick and so um, so quickly into one situation that we have to pull back right away either. And so um, I think those are all points in the in the conversation we need to have there, Ruthina. I know the increase in the in the county um, has uh, changed a lot of people's thinking. Um, I think you're going to hear that talk uh, a little bit here from Brady, and I might segue to him next a little bit to share some of those um, staff uh, feedback pieces he's getting. But as that community piece increases or if it does increase, you know, throughout the end of the summer, I think that's good reason for us to vet out that conversation and um, think about if we are going to start somewhere, are we able to sustain in that environment for a very long period of time before we'd have to transition uh, to something else relatively quickly because of what we know about the spread in the community currently. So um, in this, I'm not sure there's a 100% right answer um, with, with whatever we do. You guys have kind of seen and articulated a lot of the challenges on both ends of the conversation. And, and honestly, it becomes difficult for us as an employer um, that, you know, as Brady's going to talk to you about, about some of the feedback from our teaching staff, and then also as a, as a service we provide in the community uh, to folks and uh, kind of trying to resolve those two issues about how to treat our employees right and consider their health and safety. And then also trying to provide that valuable service that we know is absolutely critical uh, for our students and to keep them learning and, and to keep them uh, engaged with school. Um, that's the challenge, right? And I think that's the honest conversation to have uh, with our school community around trying to balance those two and, and figure out how we do the best um, in that scenario for our, for our people and for our students. And so, Brady, maybe you want to jump in and share a little bit about that. And I don't mean to cut off the questions, but I also don't want to forget to throw it over to Brady so you have some of that context too as we maybe transition to this larger picture conversation for a few moments. Yeah, uh, thanks, Matt. I appreciate that. And I'd just like to start by, you know, of course, saying um, thank you to the board. You know, your service, especially, you know, you run for the board and you know it's going to be hard, but no one signs up, you know, for this on a volunteer basis. So just a really, um, you know, profound thank you from uh, staff and teachers uh, to the board members, administrators, at the central office and building levels, a huge thanks to them too. I mean, they work through the summer and they're dealing with, you know, all their normal things and then also trying to figure out this and manage all of our emotions that are out there. You know, we had a great uh, productive collaborative meeting with um, a lot of the ESC administrative team on health and safety. Um, and, you know, we appreciate being able to say, we'd like to have a meeting and, and they say, absolutely, when do you want to do it? Let's schedule it. And I just think that's really a testament to the relationship that we have. Um, I have to say too, I'm going to do a couple of thanks you, thank yous. The ICEA leadership team has been phenomenal and they're carrying a lot of weight right now because their colleagues are telling them things um, about their own personal situations or their family situations or their own anxieties and concerns. And those are, those are, uh, they're very heavy. I mean, you hear that phrase and in, you know, sometimes you don't fully understand that until people start to share with you and you think this is just really, uh, this is heavy, you know, and, um, you know, in particular with our survey, Monique Kotman and Megan Johnson uh, throughout this have been just fantastic advocates for their colleagues. Um, and I know there's a lot of teachers here attending. So I just want to give a shout out, you know, to all of you for everything that you're doing through the summer. You're on tons of different committees and you're planning, you're preparing. And just like all of us, we want to know. Um, I think it was probably Paul who said those are the two questions, you know, what's the plan and when are we going to know it? And that's certainly what we're uh, hearing as well. And I think, you know, I'd like to just say, I appreciate Janet um, asking last time, where are teachers at on this? I think um, I really appreciate that that's a sentiment. And I know that others on the board have that as well. And I was hesitant at, at that moment to say a lot about the four models. But what I can tell you, and I could have told you even last week, um, you know, is that we love teaching. You know, our goal is to be eventually, when it's safe, 
back on site with our students and our colleagues. I mean, that's what we love to do. And that's, that's teachers, that's building level administrators, uh, that's our custodians, our nutrition people, that's up and down the line. And I just, you know, it's a vibrant, chaotic place in the best sense possible when you think about our schools. And until you sort of live it and walk through it and experience it, it's hard to like understand that level of chaos and, and vibrancy. And when it's really working really, really well, there's a lot of proximity and intimacy that goes into being into the teaching and learning experience. It's those small sort of no one sees it, discrete redirections of students. It's the words of encouragement that are in close uh, contact. It's small reading groups. It's rooms full of our elementary specialists and musicians. And, you know, that, that's what makes this, I think, really, really hard. We're moving small town, small Iowa towns into indoor spaces. You know, I was a sm I grew up in a small town. You know, it wasn't much bigger than West High School. And that's sort of, as people have asked me, you know, how are some of the outdoor things going? I say, yeah, it's not a real apples to apples comparison, is it? Because we're talking about moving things indoors. And so I think that for the teachers and the staff and the building administrators, uh, as we're thinking about this, um, I just, you know, there is an intensity there. And I think that there's a range of really powerful emotions that people are feeling. And there's, we have a deep commitment to our students and to our colleagues and to our community and to our profession, but we're afraid and concerned and anxious. And I think those create a dissonance that sometimes is hard for people to process or know what to do with. And it even creates a level of anxiety about expressing it. There's a level of guilt that I hear from teachers or they say, I feel guilty for saying I'm nervous because I feel like I'm letting my team down. I feel like I'm letting my students down but I just feel very anxious. And so I think that's where, I think that's sort of where teachers and staff are at, you know, and I urge all of us, I think on this Zoom and the attendees, and I urge the public just to have patience and grace with us. Um, you know, we're doing the best that we can. Everyone in the system is really trying to figure it out. And we understand the varying perspectives, but we all as a community are, are gonna have to be better, our best versions of ourselves, and then even better than that. And that's just, we have to be united. We have to prioritize safety and we're gonna to have to just work through some really hard things together. And I know that's where the teachers are at. I feel very confident in saying that. They're ready, in spite of all of those concerns and anxieties, they're ready to be innovative partners and uh, to work with the district to try to figure this out um, the, the best that we can. And I know the building level administrators are right there as are the ESC administrators and sort of up and down the line in our system. So. You know, as a process after the last meeting, we uh, met as a leadership team and it was a very intense couple of hours. I just have to be true and to honor the sentiment of people that there is a real profound sense of concern about our plan. And after we met, we created a Google document and had a list of considerations and questions and perspectives that would help us to focus our um, our work with the ESC administrators that we did the next day. And it was an awesome session. And I think they would also attest to the intensity and the emotions of, of, um, of the folks on it. Not in a way that's at all accusatory, but just in a way that like we're trying, this is a serious, serious issue. We're in a global pandemic and a county and a state with rising cases. And so we ended up doing a survey. We had phenomenal response. We have about 450 teachers that have weighed in um, you know, through the survey. And they did it over the, the 4th of July weekend. And I think that probably speaks to their level of um, attentiveness uh, and concern about where we're going. And we, disag we can disaggregate it and we ask questions so we could try to break it down in a variety of ways. And I guess the highlights would be when we asked people what their priorities were and we gave them six options, the dominant choice was to be able to follow CDC guidelines on physical distancing face coverings or face mask, which we deeply appreciate the district is there on. And their second place choice was the ability to have smaller class sizes or to limit the number of kids they have daily contact with. Those were your two, those were the two highest priorities for teachers and it wasn't even that close actually. And the one, um, so I'd say those are our, I'll sort of leave it as the two uh, priorities. When we asked about the models and, um, we asked not just about the four models that were offered, we also asked uh, respondents to say if they would be comfortable with um, doing um, you know, remote continuous learning. 
uh, to, to, for the year. Or if they had a hybrid model that we weren't considering, they would like consider. So we had about six options. And the option that had the least support in terms of comfort level of teachers moving into it, as well as the model they, if they had to choose when they made that choice or did the, the survey that they would have chosen was model one, the on-site model. And I think the, and it was clearly not something that staff or teachers were comfortable with and not something that they would have supported at that moment in time. And I think the realities are that the, the vibrancy and the chaos and the number of students we have in our buildings makes it hard for, for teachers and staff to figure out how you do physical distancing. And we're seeing, I think, in some of this conversation, the challenges that go along with even cohorts and our rich, I mean, we have amazing programming in the schools. And so people are super passionate as they should be about the work they've done over decades to develop that program. And I think that's where you're gonna see you know, challenges in any model, but that, that is the one that you know, definitely the, the teachers that we surveyed and that responded were not uh, supportive of. Um, there was a lot of interest in you know, the zero to 25 model or beginning in a uh, remote continuous learning model and then seeing how sort of conditions you know, played out. Uh, there was also consideration of the AB model at the PK through 12 uh, level. That probably is the single vote getter was the highest. Um, if you look at the six as standalone uh, items. And I guess I would say to all of us and to the public, you know, the model we choose to start the year doesn't necessarily dictate the model we'll be in at the end. And I think that if I would have asked the question differently uh, of teachers, I might have said, um, in those six options, do you support starting in a remote continuous learning environment in the fall and as conditions change and ideally improve transition to different models? Because I think that probably would have been um, the one that got chosen that got chosen the, the most. And teachers were aware. I mean, there's, there's pros and cons to all of those things. We want to see our kids, you know. And we also, you know, Remote continuous learning, if that's what happens in the fall, will not look like it did in the spring. I think that's important for the public to know. It's going to be more rigorous. There's going to be more feedback. There's going to be more structure. It's just not going to look like it is in the spring when we were really scrambling. And I would also say, I guess, to all of us and to the public, if we're on site, it won't look like February. When you look at that list of considerations that the administrative team laid out, teaching and learning is going to be different. That's just a given. And so I think someone, maybe it was Matt, you know, it said, what puts this in the best position to have a longer duration of on-site? And that's where I think on-site to start, model one, you know, teachers just, as they work through all of that, just said, you know, that's just not gonna, you know, that's not gonna do it. And I guess the last thing I would say as well, please, all of us, that's, please, please, please do our best to follow the recommendations of our local health officials. Practice physical distancing. Wear a mask when you can't do that. Certainly wear it, you know, inside. And, um, you know, if you're sick, don't go to work and limit your exposure. If we want to have a chance, I think in the 2021 school year, we all have to really double down and really be uh, diligent and disciplined about that. And, um, you know, I'd also say as my other thing, we will we're gonna need subs. <laughs> so if you're here or listening to this or seeing it, I would also say, if you haven't, uh, you know, I think there are some, you know, co online conversations about, you know, this just get everybody back. And if that's the model we were to choose, we will need people that are gonna help when you look at those standards. And so I guess that's where I would go. I really appreciate the opportunity to represent teachers. I don't often, or rarely, um, in this, maybe not a good quality of mine, but I rarely get uh, sort of nervous about representing the voice of teachers. But this one makes me uh, nervous. I feel a very deep uh, responsibility to make sure that we're advocating for our students and for our staff. And um, the level of concern that's out there is, is profound. And I'm sure you're seeing that in your correspondence. Certainly, if in your household you have a teacher, I'm sure you're feeling it. So. Um, I mean, I have, I'd take any questions, of course, um, you know, just really uh, you know, do appreciate the opportunity to, to share some of that. 
Hey, Brady, can I just say, uh, you know, I, I had this kind of conversation sort of via email with, the, with someone today, but, you know, on the school board, we have three people who have teacher spouses. Um, and we also have, I think it's five of the seven of us have students in the district. Um, six, if you count students that go to the university. Um, sorry, Charlie, I'm leaving you out on some of these here. Um, <laughs> Hey, our kids, we have two kids still in town here, so. There you go. Um, but so I think, you know, uh, we, we definitely appreciate and are thinking of uh, both teachers and students, um, not only for our own sake, because we hear it a lot and we're living it personally, but, um, you know, that's what all seven of us signed up for when we ran for the board is that we want to make the best decisions for not only our students, but the staff involved. So uh, I know in my decisions and my thinking that that's, uh, something that um, I always have in the in the back of my mind when I'm making these decisions. So uh, we're definitely, like you said, trying to make the right decision. It just is a really tough decision to make, and it's never going to please everyone. So we appreciate everything that you guys have put into this. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. Yeah, we really appreciate the board and our administrative teams. We know in our district that our relationship across our employee groups with our administrative teams and the board is very different. And I just can't tell you how grateful we are for that. And it is a, it's a, it's a really challenging puzzle to try to put together. I will say on the AB, I'll just, I should add my one specific thing that, that people asked about a lot in the surveys or gave us feedback about was some, if, if that were to be a model that was um, in place at some point, whether there could be consideration of doing two days in a row, like a day followed by another a day, then B day followed by another B day. People laid out, I won't get into all the specifics, but there were some real specific sort of teaching learning components that they felt like uh, made better sense. And I think one of the challenges for our district is that, you know, Des Moines and Omaha sort of laid their cards on the table uh, early on. And, you know, they have a, they, they sort of use that, the A day, A day, Omaha has a good break uh, for deep clean and then B day, B day. But just as I, I, I would say that to say that we, you know, ICA, we're certainly, looking forward to continuing those conversations and being a partner with the district as we explore it in pretty fast, you know, fashion, obviously. Hey, Brady, I just uh, wanted to thank you and Monique and everyone for the work that you guys have been doing and let you know, um, you know, we've been inundated with emails um, and a lot of people are, are citing the AAP guidance to us. Um, and I am well aware of one of the main criticisms of that guidance is that it's focused, it's student focused, and it's not teacher focused, and it's not focused on keeping our staff safe. Um, and I'm also aware that the CDC, being at age of 65 or higher, puts you in a risk class. And so our, our riskiest staff members are teachers who have dedicated decades of their lives to teaching our students. And um, you know, it's, it's, I, I really, I'm at least committed to recognizing that we, we have to take care of our teachers and we have to take care of our teachers who, again, have, have really spent their entire careers working in the district. And it, it really feels um, unpleasant to think about moving forward with decisions that disregard their health and safety. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Lisa. I, that's absolutely the case. I think that's going to require, and I've said this to them, you know, all the different groups that I've been able to work with, we're going to have to be flexible for each other. So I think there's a question about assignment changes and no one wants an assignment change in August. There's no question. The sooner you know that that might happen, of course, the better, but it might, it might happen because we do have to honor that level of commitment that all of our folks have made. And it might mean we have to make some adjustments and be innovative. So yeah, thanks. Yeah. And Brady, I know you said you're a little nervous to, represent that teacher voice but I think you always do it well and you do it in a professional manner and you communicate the ideas you know uh, appropriately and the the thing I would say is that nobody questions the uh, teachers want to to do the job they're going to do um, you know and to be able to do that job and to be able to do what they're good at you know I think that's the um, that we need to have that as, as an operating assumption and I think that's how we've approached the conversations with you guys and so um, I know that's hard, you know, when you're advocating for something that might not look at what look like what you're the best at um, in that way, or that, you know, people are fearful to 
um, maybe do some of those other scenarios. But I would just say, you know, I, I think we all have that understanding. It's not from a desire of not wanting to be there in person and not wanting to do that. It's, it's just like people have identified or board members have identified already that rid of in the crux of the, the difficult, you know, position in front of us. And so, so when I think about that for the, for the board here, I guess from based on what you had tonight, and I don't mean to necessarily cut off questions to Brady, if you have more, more thoughts you wanted to share with him, but maybe as you're also thinking through that, if there's additional information, that was kind of where I started the meeting uh, with was what additional information would you guys still need from us uh, to be able to have that uh, what I feel is probably a necessary conversation next week about where we anticipate uh, beginning the school year and, and what holes are still out there and you're thinking to be able to provide us some direction in the next week to get together uh, that piece for you. And I have a timeline question, I guess, because uh, it's one piece that people ask about. Um, the state deadline, I think it's like the 15th if you're going to open and roll into like an actual <laughs> online learning academy versus what we may be offering for online uh, is that does that hold is that something that we need to make a decision here soon so people can make that choice or is that deadline do you know is that extended i mean personally i would hate for anybody to open and roll out of our district because i think we're going to be able to um, offer them something that's going to be great here but for those people who are yeah. making a consideration We've been answering that question with that we, you know, any option we do would provide an option for students to do at home learning. That that's an assumption in our plans is that as we talk through that with you guys that they would be able to do that. And so we would like them to start to, to stay with us. Some people still have pursued the open enrollment option that has to be done by July 15th. I don't really think it changes necessary our timeline because we've answered the question of there will be an at home learning experience. We haven't necessarily been able to detail that out very well at this point to uh, some of those families that have asked about it, but they um, they have been, the those that are considered staying that weren't just an automatic, we wanna open and roll out for this reason, have been willing to listen. They have talked, you know, we have talked through how our expectations would be more robust in the spring. It would look different in that sense so that they wouldn't maybe jump to one of those virtual academies. So we've been having some good conversations with folks around that, but you're right, that July 15th deadline is out there. I, I think, um, parents are aware of that, have been asking, you know, uh, about the potential to pursue that, but we've been trying to come back quickly with, we will have a at-home learning experience here, uh, primarily hosted online, that you would be able to be engaged with if you don't feel the need to leave the district. So I, I think that addressed your question of what you're asking there, Paul. Yeah, it does. And I just I kind of wanted to point it out because I really want people to hear what both you and Brady said about what our online learning option is not going to look like what it did in the spring. And I really hope people um, that are considering that really talk to either you guys or take take a look, like you said, at what we're going to do and stick with our district because I think it's great. Hey, Matt. Um, this is Janet. Real fast. I know um, it's been a long meeting and a lot of amazing information and thought process from the district. Um, Brady, the the work that the teachers group did over the last week work after over the last week is amazing. And um, what struck me in all of the conversation tonight is just the depth of responsibility we all face, recognizing that any choice that we make is not going to be a great choice. Uh, we want our students back in the classroom, we want our teachers back in the classroom, we want to have that rich, chaotic experience, Brady, that you were just describing. And whichever option we choose is not going to be that. And so um, for me, a couple things is uh, a question that I had earlier, and, and I think Charlie was uh, hitting on it, and I think Ruthina a little bit too, but I I'm curious about um, testing capabilities. Um, for me, a question that I have around any choice that we take, are we going to have more testing opportunities? And maybe this is a conversation with University of Iowa or Test Iowa or other public health you know, uh, groups. If a student has to test negative in order to come back to school or for us to be able to tell whether we need to quarantine or not quarantine, I mean, that those have consequences in terms of the movement of students and who's learning at home and versus who's back in the classroom. And right now it's not super accessible to get a test. I've had one, um, my son and I have been quarantining for the last couple of weeks because my daughter was got tested uh, positive and it's not easy to get a test. And, and I think if we're gonna have this as a component of our ability to decide when we close schools or send classes home, 
we have to have some better access to testing. And so that's one thing. And, and, and are, are there things that we can do with our health officials, public Johnson County, University of Iowa, Test Iowa, whatever, recognizing that it's a really big community deal to open schools and have students back in the classroom. Are there things our community, can, our community can do to support that initiative? Another thing, I think whichever option that we choose, we have to do some work with our business community and our employers in the community to provide some flexibility for, for their employees who may need to have time off, who may need to have to work from home, who may need to care for their children who are now quarantined because our district is saying they can't go to school for two weeks. And so are there things that we can do working with ICAD, Chamber of Commerce, other, uh, you know, uh, other groups in our community to create some flexibility and awareness and understanding. This truly is a community issue that we're all facing, that we all are in this together. And I think that would help create some assurance that whichever model we take, if we've got some, some increased access to testing, we've got some increased ability to communicate these processes to families in multiple languages and multiple modes, as you've described, Matt, and then some outreach, and I'm happy to help with this in any way I can. Um, can we create this sense of, I think Brady said grace and patience because this isn't normal. This isn't what we're used to doing. It's gonna impact everybody in our community. Can we please try to find ways of working together to solve these problems and support all of us, all of our employees, all of our team members, all of our students, all of our teachers, all of, everyone involved needs support and some grace as we work through this and you know the, these ideas of working together. So I'm just wondering if there's some things we can do along those lines as we, whatever choice that we make in terms of opening or how learning is gonna take place in the fall, what assurance, what commitments, what things can we get from our community to help support the, the, the people in our district as we move forward? Matt, can I take the testing part and then you can talk to the community part? Yep, go ahead. Um, so, Jan and I, I hear you and, and what the others offer on the testing piece. And so that's something definitely we can put as the top of our list for the health and safety team to continue to work on and take that question back to the, the doctors on that committee and, and also to Johnson County Public Health. And um, so I don't have a, a concrete answer for you, but what I, what I do want to say about that is that um, we want everyone to know, both intern and extern, that, that we are working very closely with, with Johnson County Public Health, that those are the health experts. That we're, we're the educators, we're not the health experts. And so we're trying to take our cues from them. And, and the guidance that I mentioned earlier, we're taking language verbatim from what the Iowa Department of Health is putting out and the CDC, because we want to rely on those resources. You talked about that sense of community coming together. And so we're trying to reach out and use those. And so we'll take those questions about testing and access to testing and, and, and what we need to put in place um, to them. But then we also want to follow their guidance if they come back to us with and say, you know, these are the best steps that you can take to protect your staff and to, and to protect your students. And so um, we will continue to explore that and see um, what, what we can do because again, health and safety is at the top of, of our list. Um, and we're going to take our cues from what our local um, health experts are, are, are telling us in that, in that regard. Yeah, and I would say on the, the just one little add on to the testing there, you know, we already got a little piece of information from even maybe how some of our Healthy Kids Clinic can help with that for families. And I guess that one was front of mind for me a little bit because um, I think Janet's exactly right. We have to approach this as a community conversation um, that it can't be one entity trying to solve a problem and another entity trying to solve a different problem, that there has to be that willingness to talk to each other and figure out what we can do. Um, I think our, if we go to one of our commitments at the beginning, something we have to also pay special attention to and account for is that equity consideration and knowing that sometimes as we develop those broad partnerships or even if we have a broad community plan, those left behind are our most disadvantaged folks um, that won't be accounted for in some of that or don't have jobs that even if we get mass flexibility across the community that will be flexible or that will allow them to miss work. And so I think that that conversation is especially important, but we also have to consider the impact on our structurally disadvantaged kids. And that was something we talked about repeatedly throughout the spring about their access um, in that different environment. And even as we make it more robust, uh, that challenge becomes greater. And so 
again, no perfect answer, no perfect solution, uh, but I just think it's one when we say it's on the front end of our considerations and a factor we think about in our planning, we also have to hold ourselves true to that and, and to think about that component. So um, we'll take back the part about the testing and see what else can be done um, with that and see how we can partner. And I think also this idea of the patience and grace and, and trying to think about um, what do we do to try to partner as a community in this regard to increase flexibility uh, for families and uh, to be understanding of their situation. Um, because I do think we, we've heard from parents that are fearful too on some level that um, you know, the, their flexibility for their job may not be what it is um, or may not be what is desired in the sense, and, and that's not going to be increased if we bring everybody back to school. They're not going to get increased flexibility. I, I, I totally get it. I mean, I, I, I get that, but, but I, I, I do worry most about those students and families too, though, because whichever option we choose, if we end up having to send a class home, that group will be mostly in, adversely impacted, right? I mean, it's, it's, these are really, really hard problems to solve for right now. And, um, and I'm, I'm with you that the, the, the equity uh, matter needs to be really, really top of mind um, so that we provide as much support as we can for, for folks who may not have as much flexibility as others do. So I, I'll continue to explore that, you know, throughout the week. Um, Janet and I are involved in a, Janet through her private role as ACT and um, me through the district with the Project Better Together conversation. There's been the community conversation around masks. I think there's a, a community conversation need to be had here about whatever the district explores for models and how businesses and employers can, can create flexibility for their employees or where that even the status of that conversation is now. And so um, I think just to be honest with people, that's one that we need to continue to have as, as a larger community to Janet's point there and, and to look for that. And so um, the other thing I think about that we've talked a few times about, and I, I don't, it's, it's not an idea we've discussed a lot internally, but that might be one um, that would appeal to your interests would be some type of a tr potential transition timeline. Um, I, it seems like that idea had some tr traction in thinking or at least Zoom body language as people talked about at different times would be, I wonder if that would be something that would be of interest to the board to look at um, what a potential ramp up timeline would be or a transition timeline would look like to start in one model for a period of time to amp up to another model with the end goal. You know, I think our end goal, of course, at the end of the year is to have our kids back in front of teachers and to have things look as, as normal as possible, but we don't know how long it's going to take to get there. And so if we start from that assumption as the end goal, what does the in-between look like? And so I don't know, I would just look for some responses to see, is that something you would be interested in the admin team putting together? And I think that would maybe also uh, assuage some of the community conversation to know when we would be looking at doing some different things instead of it's got to be exactly this way on August 24th. Um, Matt, I'll say, I, I think it was Diane that alluded to that, that said, even if we can get them in person for the first two weeks, that'll give us such a great way to get them familiar with the tech and, and do some online learning. And, and when she said that, that caught my attention. Um, so in, in terms of talking about starting in, we're going to do this model for three weeks and then, but it's just, it's a, it's a temporary, I, I would be interested in, in exploring that idea more, um, cause I can certainly see the benefits of walking those kit, walking our students through what online learning is going to look like in person to, instead of just going straight online. Yeah, I, no, go ahead, Charlie. Well, I, I just say, I, 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 that's very intriguing to me too. Yeah, it's kind of in line with what I, I was going to say. Um, you know, this was my initial thought last week and Brady certainly confirmed it. Um, there's no physical way that we can have 90% of our kids in the building and socially distance them. I mean, that's just not, we just don't have space. Um, and and I want to know what everybody else wants to know that we can't know, which is what is the condition going to be in two weeks and a month from now. But I don't see any signs that anything is happening that's going to make things better. And so my kind of cost payoff thinking about what's the worst thing that could happen with a 90% return, that worst case scenario is not acceptable to me. It's just not an acceptable risk. There's, there's two too much involved, uh, both for staff and for students. So I think whatever we do, I, to me, the wisest course seems to start slow and build up 
to capacity. That that and and I would be very much interested in seeing what that would look like. And, and maybe you guys then can come up with some metrics, kind of like we have our metrics for what happens when schools close. What are our metrics then to say, hey, this looks like things are trending in the right direction, so we can start in. Um, and then I also just want to say Brady's comment about having two A days and two B days from a teaching and learning perspective. I very much understand why it would be beneficial to have a cohort of kids two days in a row. So the one thing, the, the only thing I'll say is, you know, if we work on some type of a transition thing um, in a ramp up timeline, I still feel a great sense of urgency that we have to signal to the public something as we approach next week, right, as we get to Tuesday. I mean, we can't leave them hanging out there. And so there's a, there's a few components in what you said there, and we'll do our best to turn those around. Um, and I've been taking notes here about what some of those data data points might be. Um, but as we think about that, I don't, I want to give you as complete picture as we can, right, about what that's going to be. But I don't also want to, I guess, set people up that we're continuing to delay it based on, well, we couldn't get this turned around for you or we don't have this component yet, so we don't want to commit to it. So that's the only thing I'm a little bit fearful on. We can make some tweaks and adjustments and provide the additional information. I just, I guess I want us to have that similar sense of, and I, I think from seeing you guys shake your heads, I, I can see some of that too, that, that that's on your minds and that people don't want to keep waiting either. But um, yeah, Matt, I, I'd be, I mean, I would not vote for a 90% return. I just in yep. good conscience couldn't, but I'd be ready to, to look at some type of hybrid. And, and I do want to make the decision on that next week. Um, okay. Yeah. So I'm hearing like a, oh, sorry, Lisa, go ahead. That's okay. I was going to say, I echo everything JP said. I would also say though, it's what I'm hearing and what I'm very supportive of is online option, no matter what. And so I, I would almost say that we can start standing that up now. And the sooner that we can get that in place and the sooner we can open it up and see how many parents actually do want to take advantage of it, that's going to, I think, help drive a lot of our other decision making because we'll have a better idea of class sizes and, and are we looking at 20 desks, which is feasible, or are we looking at 26 desks, which is not going to be feasible. Sure. Matt, other thoughts can, or you, information it, can you briefly um, talk about what we discussed yesterday in um, regards to what we're kind of guessing, I guess, whether our, our hands are tied or not tied in regards to what a, when we get to decide on school closures and what defines a school closure, because it sounds like it's a little bit up in the air from the state level. And I don't want us to um, work out this great plan and then have this uh, the rug yanked out from underneath us and say, nope, you have to have all the schools open because I feel fairly comfortable that we can kind of do what we want, but there is a little gray area there that we talked about yesterday. So can you kind of walk us through that? Yeah, the issue, there's kind of two issues. And I, I asked the question to John Spear, the chief of the AEA today, a little bit too, and he um, gave some helpful answer. And then tomorrow, um, Director Lebo is supposed to be at our superintendent meeting. And so I'm sure this question will get posed to her. And I put it in the docket to get asked, but um, part of the question is around if the governor's emer health, emergency health proclamation expires, um, are we allowed to still exist in these different models or does that now count as a school closure and we'd be in violation of uh, what she's allowed us to do in that sense. And so right now, the general sentiment or interpretation of that has been um, I, that we're trying to assume, I guess, that even if that does, we've been asked to develop these return to learn plans and that's not technically a closure, that's us delivering services. Our, our buildings aren't technically closed, we're just delivering education in a different way. We just would feel a lot more comfortable if we had that directly stated and um, we feel like maybe that's been answered in a, in a, a venue or two, but um, a more direct answer to that point would be helpful. And then also a little bit of controversy around uh, being able to offer that complete online um, experience for students um, as that's built into several districts return to learn plans in a responsible fashion to do that. Um, that if you take a strict interpretation of a Senate file, it would lead you to potentially believe that we couldn't do that, that that would have to rest with the virtual providers in the state. But again, the superintendents um, that I've been engaged with are not reading it that way. Um, that's not the way our UEN folks um, 
have, have looked at that, but we're looking to get additional clarification to provide uh, further confidence that we're okay in that regard. But it would, it would seem uh, somewhat irresponsible to have developed return to learn plans over the three models and then to not have um, either the proclamation in place or the flexibility to allow us to exist in those three models after spending the time to do that. So um, we're hopeful that it doesn't turn into a larger issue, but as I talked to Sean about yesterday, that's one we're continuing to monitor. Um, and Matt and John, this is Brady. ISEA, the state level organization that's working on those as well. We have a meeting on Thursday, so I'll pose those questions specifically to, I think it's a hot, you know, it's obviously a hot topic for a lot of districts. Um, so I'll see if they have any insights, then I'll just share that directly with everyone, if, if they do. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to make the most sense that they've asked us to, you know, put together these plans that they would then allow us to actually fulfill the plan. Uh, but I also know that at our state level, we don't always make great decisions and we sort of follow some other states that have not made great decisions. Um, which if I remember, I think the state of Florida just mandated that campuses all had to be open. So I could, you know, past history tells me that I should be scared of what our state government might or might, or might not do to us. Um, but I, I would agree that current state seems that they wouldn't have asked us to make these plans if we couldn't then, you know, fulfill the plan, so. Yeah, and the DE somewhat answered it in the FAQ document, but I think that's the, the piece that made us a little nervous about why did that maybe even still need to be further addressed and, and why is that sentiment out there? And so you're right, Sean, I mean, it's one we, you know, try to have confidence in, but, it, but it's hard to do. And so um, there's still some questions. We'll work to get additional clarification and like I said, support that or provide that confidence that we have in, in pursuing those plans. But, but that was a PCI that we had, we had discussed yesterday. So I heard metrics for, you know, make, maybe making um, some further decisions about uh, starting school or not, or any informed, you know, Ruthina had that point earlier. Um, uh, and we talked that that through a little bit about what would we what would help us make a decision about what to start with uh, based on current status in the community. Um, and then if we were going to explore this idea of a ramp up model or a period of time to come to school and learn a few things and then sit, exist in a different model for a period of time and then come back to campus. Um, what are some maybe some measures that way. Um, so we'll do our best we can to try to work with our health experts to, to develop some of those and then to think about what a, you know, a maybe transition overall transition timeline could look like uh, between some of the some of the modeling if, if that's something that would be helpful to look at. So I think we've laid out the model choices for you some of the health and safety things we could do. Uh, if we're in one of those, it would be a lot easier for us to obviously pursue and, and ramp um, our work in those areas up and begin uh, the sooner we have a decision and get moving on that. And so, um, and even having something like this that we're talking about now would be helpful to know, okay, where are we gonna start? What do we need to plan for and prepare? And I think it would give a lot of people um, some known, known factors to start to work from. So anything else that would be helpful or that I'm missing and is that what I'm trying to repeat back to what I think I heard? I think uh, I, I would agree with what Sean said about um, the decisions that our, our, our governor has made, especially with the uh, uh, press conference or whatever you want to call it today, where basically our president said schools are going to be open. Um, we, we know that uh, our state has tended to follow that guidance. Uh, but I, I would like to say, Matt, like I think, I don't know if you can just pull us, but I, I might be the third person that has basically said, I don't imagine that that 90-10 model is going to work at all. Like we can't open with that. And we're looking at one of those hybrid models. So, I mean, I think we're, we're trying to narrow it down to like, you can bring just back that hybrid model with that ramp up and not, and, and maybe I'm, I mean, I see Lisa shaking her head and Sean and, and Ruthina and myself and uh, JP and um I just don't think that 90-10, we should probably just say that's not going to happen. I'm, I'm not in the to that decision. No, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. So what if, um, what if we're exploring then essentially a conversation where we would bring some students on campus to learn uh, some of those remote learning techniques like Diane had mentioned and, and Lisa drew back to, and then also another one that would um, maybe slowly ramp up uh, to some continue or sustained 
uh, in-person delivery of services in an AB format. I think we could also talk about that, right? Like what's a graduated timeline to step in and teach routines or, or something to that effect. I mean, I know I'm kind of going off script here from the team, so they're probably going to be a little frustrated with me here later, but I'm trying to think through this idea of timelines and the models that are still in play and then how we get to one of those uh, models in that sense. And so it's almost like you'd have them on site would be maybe one scenario, you teach them some of these routines and they go home and exist in that continuous learning uh, environment for a period of time at home. And the other one might be you start slower and try to build up to as many, uh, as high of a percentage as we would feel comfortable with kids on campus. Uh, but maybe we wouldn't have to start with exactly all of the students there right away, even in an AB experience, or even um, I heard some conversation about two A days in a row or two B days in a row. You know, I, th I think we can definitely look at those things too. Does that sound reasonable or kind of in line with some of the thinking you guys are having? Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think it's, uh, I think it definitely, I keep going back to pre-K and kindergarten kids. Um, like I just don't understand how some of those parents being maybe new parents to the district or new parents uh, to schools in general, um, or the teachers trying to relate to those new students. I think that's just going to be super tough if it was right out of the gate, it was online. So, I mean, having some of those kids being able to come into the school and learn systems and programs and how stuff works. And um, that's gonna, I think be super helpful, but that's just me speaking out loud. Um, I'm, I'm also not willing to completely walk away from the pre-K to four carve out from the AB um, just because of the childcare issues. And, and I wonder, I'd be open to a PK through three or some some riff on that, but. That was just gonna be my next question, Lisa. If there was, you know, if there was still interest in the PK four or um, if we were really talking about a straight AB, um, because I do think, um, you know, we're gonna continue to hear people concerned about the childcare. And I think what Janet was talking about earlier, as much as we have that conversation, that's still gonna be a legitimate concern and fear for people until some of those questions get answered. And so um, I, I was kind of wondering the same thing or the team was wondering the same thing here about if that one was still in play in our thinking. Well, well and I'd be, I'd be interested if we modeled out PK through three, the, the way that you modeled out with taking the fifth and sixth grades out and what that'll do to the class sizes and, and reducing them, if we put the fourth graders on the AB model also, will that further reduce, could we further reduce the pre-K to three class sizes and thus kind of make those classrooms safer just because there's less kids in them? Um, just trying to balance the, the safety and the getting, getting those younger kids in person. I, I'd be interested if, if that was a substantial change. No, I think it's a good idea to look at that. That shouldn't be that difficult. I also am noticing that the uh, PK4 uh, option is uh, 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 is like the second preference for uh, teachers uh, when they were asked to uh, identify their uh, the pref their preferred model. Yeah, yeah. I would. I um, it's that's an interesting when you break that down by secondary versus elementary teachers, you get a different result as you, as you might imagine. The secondary teachers were a lot more comfortable with it than the elementary teachers. So I'll just have to be honest as, as you disaggregated that data. And I think that if we were to consider that, we still, you know, I, I and not to add too many variables, you know, into it, um, but probably looking at an even smaller set, I agree with, I get what Paul's saying. I mean, I think a lot of teachers would also say that even if they're not a, you know, kindergarten or first grade teacher, that's a really different experience, the preschool versus uh, in through first or second grade. Um, I think we'll have to just, you know, the physical distancing is still going to be challenging. I think the teachers would want to sort of see some data on what a class size might look like, um, you know, if, if you were to do that. So, you know, some of the work that was done with five and six and what a elimination of RAM modeling for a year, um, you know, would do. But there's probably some things that you could also look at that would be like selected groups coming on for a more intensive onboarding experience in those younger grade levels, which you could still maybe socially or physically distance. There might be some creative ways you could accomplish, you know, both of those if we, you know, sat down and took a look at it. So in the idea about what all the specifics of those might look like might not be turned in around in a week, but like a, 
orientation or a you know some type of a opportunity I think we could account for in a schedule uh, piece I think we'd want to continue to work with our teams and, and Brady on, on some of those components um, within those groups to know what would be the best practice in there and um, we're not going to guarantee to have exactly determine what that best practice would look like but if it's from a timeline standpoint I think we could account for what might be an appropriate amount of time to do that and then how we transition through those different components so I think that all makes sense are there other kind of comments or thoughts about things we need to be considering or even differing I just I just wanted to verbalize that I, I mentioned child care because of PK through three but I also want to revisit that that's when our opportunity gap really cements and I I'm sure that we have some third grader entering third graders that are going to be right on the cusp of of that and if we send them online all year we might lose them forever and so when we we look at the equities of educating kids those younger kids and getting them in classroom this is such a critical stage for them that again when balancing things i, I think we have to consider that in in the balance i agree with that with lisa too and uh, i uh, well i don't want to i don't want to argue the safety issues really uh it seems to me like that there's the uh, uh, CDC and the APA have had indicated pretty basically that very young children probably don't present a, uh, a significant safety issue, you know, to, to, to folks my age. So, Matt, I, I, I think uh, I, I really like the idea of, you know, kind of starting at the the end goal, right, of having all the kids back in school and working, you know, from that point to create a timeline from the starting point to get there and all of those transition points of, you know, this ramp up process. So if I'm understanding this right, what we're hoping to get probably by the time we're done with our meeting next Tuesday is what the starting point is. Is that what you're kind of looking for from us? Yeah, I think we'd like to know a starting point. And then if we are talking about some type of a slow ramp up, potentially that we have some consensus on what that might look like or what we might ramp up to. I think that's the thing I'm, you know, at least what I'm hearing from you guys that 90-10 or what we were calling it 90-10 last time or is the way we tried to frame at this point is on site. Nobody's ready to, you know, get into that experience at this point in time. And so what is that eventual um, accelerated um, or accelerated, what does it get accelerated up to, I guess is what I'm saying. So you may start in one fashion, but when would we consider, you know, a PK3, PK4 every day, the other grades 5, 12, AB, when would we transition that or would we start in something like that is a different line of thinking and then um, have students and families stay at home for a period of time and do on, online learning after we've taught them some of the basics and kids being able to access that. So I think there's multiple avenues in there, but I guess what, what I would generally answer that question with, Sean, is yeah, where are we starting and where are we going? You know, do we have some consensus on that? And even if we have to adjust some timelines based on the pandemic as it continues to flow, do we have a general idea of where we're beginning and where we would like to get to and how soon? Does that answer your question? And does that make sense? I mean, is that what we're, we're saying, I guess? Yeah, I just wanna make sure that, you know, that us as a board, you know, as we get ready to meet next week to know what exactly, you know, what kind of action we need to take as a board to, to help you guys. And I, and I guess I'm not even clear that it's actually board action to vote on something versus just giving some direction. But uh, uh, I, I wanna be clear to the public that a week from now, they're gonna have a much better understanding of where we're gonna start the school year, or if it's two weeks from now or three weeks. I want, I, I want that's what I'm trying to nail down is a week from now, are we going to be able to tell the public that this is where we think we're going to start the school year and I understand that you know to Ruthina's point the next two or three weeks if our county goes you know berserk in cases and things that you know stuff will go out the window but that's you know as Paul said that those are the questions right when are we going to decide you know and so that's what I'm trying to get out there is when are we going to decide are we going to have a starting point decided next Tuesday? And if so, how do we make that happen? I'm thinking that we need, um, you know, some sort of proposal, you know, using some, this timeline guidance and 
kind of narrowing down some of the plans uh, from where we were at last week to now. I think we've kind of narrowed it down at least a little bit, but I, I think we have to have a very small list of things that we're going to hammer out next Tuesday if we're going to have an actual um, starting point, right? I, I, I don't think it, each board member can come and say, well, I think we need to do this and this and this because it will be very hard for us to land somewhere quickly. So I, I think we need to take this conversation that we've had tonight and try and distill it down to a couple of very specific things that, um, you know, we can have some discussion on and then make that decision um, sooner than later. So I, I know you're asking what we need. I'm asking you what you need from us in order to really take those next steps. Yeah, I think just, I guess the way I would answer that is a commitment to be able to signal that. I mean, I do think um, in some way we should probably um, consider some board action around it, um, just, you know, to clarify the commitment to what we're doing or if there's opposing, you know, views to what we're doing uh, that were fair uh, to folks. So that would be my suggestion on that. We will have a COVID cost resolution um, it, as well about the additional funds we anticipate. And so um, I think Chase had, and I had talked earlier today about even a, a resolution of the effect about how we, you know, intend to start the school year and, and looking for uh, some transition points about when we might need to do different things. And so we can put something together on that end as well. But I, I do think some board action would just potentially be a good idea, even if we don't have to do it uh, about where we want to start school and that, that people know uh, what's been decided. Um, but I think just that commitment to knowing, you know, we have to signal to the public about what's going to look like and we have to signal to our staff about what we're gonna do and what we're preparing for um, at this point so that we give ourselves a chance, the best chance to be successful in the, in the next four to six weeks. I mean, as I think about it, it sounds like, you know, we kind of have our continuum narrowed for the period of time right now to uh, our most, the most of the highest number of kids we'd have on campus would be PK four and five twelve every other day. And then we have this other end of the continuum where it's, it's completely offsite. We frame that from zero to 25 perspective and then what happens in between there. And then with the goal long term of, of getting back to more students on campus more regularly. So, so we'll build that out. I think we can have that. I think if you're asking me, I think it's just a commitment to, to try to work through that next week. And if um, there's additional uh, pieces, we can help you in making that decision. But I think from what you've told me tonight, I have enough to work on here uh, with the group in between. So Very good. All right, well, that's a three hour meeting. Um, is there any, anything else, any board members or admin team really wanna get out there um, for us to all chew on over the next week as we think about all these things? All right, I will also offer up my thanks to everyone on the team that has put hours in hours uh, into this and I will I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell uh, you know everyone that's uh, watching this and listening to this or will watch it later that we have heard um, all of the voices who have shared with us all of the you know the hardships if we go one way and the hardships if we go the other way and um, it is a very tough place that we're all in and I, I really appreciate um, you know Brady's comments and and, and Janet's that this is a, a communal thing and we all have to really come together to make this uh, to work and so I know all of the admin team and the various different committees have um, done that have all come together and really worked through all of these and um, I appreciate the the pain that has gone into it and knowing that even when you're suggesting going one way that you know that there will be people that that does not work for. Um, and I, I, that's been the toughest part, you know, as we all sit here. So I, I really appreciate uh, all the work that everyone's done to get to this point. Um, and I look forward to really landing uh, somewhere next week um, to for this conversation and really provide some clarity for our staff and our uh, students and their families. Um, and if nobody else uh, has anything to add, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. No, oh, to say Matt, one thing, and it's, it's going to kind of end us on a downer note, but um, <laughs> you guys received the 
the email last night about a student that had passed away at City High. And so um, definitely just wanted to acknowledge that and condolences to um, Emma Nudit's uh, family uh, from City High. She was uh, gonna be a junior um, there for us and um, active student. And so, uh, as you, you may know, uh, City High is the fourth uh, student they um, or the fourth death they've had in the last uh, calendar year so it's been a rough go uh, for that campus and those folks so wanted to let them know we were thinking about them and had them in our uh, thoughts uh, this evening as well so thanks I meant to say that in the beginning and then lost that so thanks for that chance Sean. Yes, thank you man I appreciate that. Right. With that is there a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.